special uh, thing to do before we get started here. This is all the parents are here. Eventually, we're going to move you from here to the parent group. But right now, we have um, something that we want to share. My name is Cherie Cornell. I'm the founder, executive director of the Real Talk program. Okay, I have a problem right now. Whose is this? Did you do that? Okay, we, we got to have a conversation, okay? A little bit after this, because I don't want to embarrass you any more than I have to, okay? All right? Uh, can somebody bring me one of those cards, please? The Real Talk Attitude cards? Thank you, Mr. Jesse. So listen up. Thank you. Everybody have this? Yes? How many of you guys did not get this? Can I get a few more, please? You're welcome. All right, listen. Those cards, those affirmations, I better not find any more on my floor. Do we understand? I don't want to see them tore up. I don't want to see them on the floor, period. Do you understand? Because you know what? These cost money. You need one, too? All right. There you go. Okay, as I said, I'm the founder, executive director of the Real Talk program here. I have been doing this almost 10 years as of June. We need one too, baby. What happened? How come you guys didn't get these? What's up? Put them in your pocket for now because I want your undivided attention. Cell phones? How many have cell phones? Show me. Turn them off right now. You got 10 seconds. Eight, five, if they're not off, they come to me. All right, we're going to get started. You guys who are here and returning know the routine, right? We're going to have people coming in speaking to you. But first, we're going to give you a demonstration. This program is for you. It's not for me. It's not for these ladies and gentlemen. It is specifically for you to get something out of it. Listen, all I ask out of all of you, and it's not a lot. The first thing is respect. I don't ask it really, actually, I demand it. Because if I ask you, then you take advantage of it. I'm demanding respect, okay? Second, as our speakers come forth, I'm just gonna request that you give your undivided attention and take 10% of the 90% that they, 100% that they give you. Because I know some of you won't get it all in one night, and I know some of you will tune out as they're speaking or any other speaker speaking. I know that's going to happen. That's why I only ask for 10%. Because I promise you, if you take just 10% of what you're going to hear tonight, it's going to change your life. Do you understand? So can I have you guys agree to a minimum of 10%? Can I get a show of hands that you will get 10, at least try to get 10%? Perfect. Perfect. All right? Are we good? Okay, so before I call up Mr. Lyle and tell what he does, I need you to sit up, put your butts in the back of the chair, don't slouch, and don't talk to your neighbors while my folks are talking. Okay? We have a lot of females today, which is great. Hey, how you doing, baby? How are you? Good to see you again. All right. Mr. Lyle, all of you guys pretty much know, and most of you should know that you've, who've, who've actually reviewed our website know what we do. Come on up, Mr. Lyle. We're starting off with this today. What we usually typically try to do is bring people in to show you guys activities outside of school. And for some of you, this is a problem for me, being a former athlete. For some of you that do, do, that do not do nothing after school, that is a problem. You have to find something to do because if you, positive to do, because if you don't find something positive to do, guess what? Negativity, acti negative activities will find you. So we pay for those activities up to $150 a month. As long as you have a 2.0 with passing grades and remaining compliance. And parents, we need your help too to help them do that. 
So we don't just hold the kids accountable, we hold the parents accountable. That's why you guys are going to be in the next room to hear and discuss with Dr. Keith and all of our other speakers or three other speakers over there from my program who donate their time to talk to everybody. Okay? So we're going to do a quick demonstration before we jump right into the discussion. Mr. Lyle is going to tell what he does. He has a few of his students here to share what they do. All right, Mr. Lyle, thank you for coming again. Appreciate you. Thank you, guys. I want to first say thank you to the amazing Miss Cherie and her awesome team for having us. Thank you very much. We were here, we were here last month, and I can speak for myself and our team. We were blown away by the testimonies, by the kids we met, by the parents we talked to after this incredible program that's doing so much for the next generation. And so I want to say thank you again for having us. We are from International Sports Center, right off the strip on Dean Martin. We, uh, anybody watch UFC? Any boxing fans? Hey, we got quite a few, okay? Keep those hands up when I ask you for volunteers in about two seconds. Okay, so that's, that's, that's what we do. Okay, we do a little bit of everything, giving our, giving our kids an opportunity to express themselves in the art form that we like to do. We, we offer wrestling. Anybody, any wrestlers out there? Oh, we got a few. Okay, boxing. Boxers, there we go. I think we got our, our winner right here. Okay, Muay Thai kickboxing. Anybody know what that is? Oh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Really, how about Judo? Hey, there's a lot of martial arts out there, and if you guys follow the UFC, you follow mixed martial arts. You know that it's, not, it's no longer just one art. So we like to spread it out a little bit, give everybody a little opportunity to, uh, to experience a little thing that we, that we enjoy doing. Yeah, so one, one thing I wanted to kind of talk to the parents about is that we have a, we have a summer program that's going to start up in uh, June, June and July. So if you can kind of you know, take a look at that, see if that's something that you would like to offer to your child we like to have them. I can guarantee you a couple things that they're going to get out of the program is they're going to know the art. They're going to learn something that they probably didn't even know they had the talent to be able to do, the gifts that they don't know. That's what we're here to do to help them, help them realize it and show them what they got. We also teach them a little bit of nutrition about how we can get our body healthier. Work out with weights. We do a lot of cardiovascular activity. They're going to understand the importance like you do here, the importance of teams, teammates, and how, how you need to rely on other people in order sometimes to get, to get to the goals where you want to, right? Okay, so whether it's in a cage, in the ring, we always need a partner to dance with a little bit. Okay, so I just want to show you a couple things. I want to ask two things. I want a female and a male volunteer. He was first. And she's second. Okay, so stand by. Okay, I'm going to get to you real quick. Just going to show you a couple things. Won't take, take up too much of your times. We have our students right here, Tatiana and Ryder. Okay, they've been doing it for a long time. And we'll see what they can do, right? I'm going to put them on the spot right now. Okay? Here's Sonny, our operations manager. Oh, hi. I didn't know I was going to talk today, but hello. Um, so yes, we do have a really great summer program coming up for the parents. I have some brochures of what our gym has to offer, and I also have the special summer camp flyer that is only good for the members of the Real Talk Youth Program. So I'll make sure to reach out to all the parents uh, before you guys head on to the other room. And in the meantime, Coach Lyle and Tati.
Okay, so for everyone else that's sitting out there, don't be intimidated by what you saw. What we do is we teach you the basics. We teach you the stance, the technique. We teach you everything. So if you want to try it, don't be afraid. I've been doing Muay Thai for a long, long time, 15 years. Uh, Ryder is 16. He's been doing it for about 13 years. And Tati's been doing it for 10 years or so. Um, so they do have a lot of experience, but we will teach you all of this. And when we teach you all of it, we'll have lots of fun. Because that's what it's all about. All right, we got Hassani. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Have you ever done martial arts before? Yes. Oh, what kind of martial arts? Very good. And today is your first Muay Thai lesson. In just a matter of 10 seconds, we have a professional. So you too can learn that and be part of the team. And our next volunteer. Oh, okay. So our, I, so our Muay Thai program is named Aitat Muay Thai. And on the front of Tati's shirt, it says Kick Okole. And we're all from Hawaii, and Okole means butt. So we kick him butt. But we're doing it in a nice way, in a fun way, amongst friends. And you see that big smile on her face? That's what we want you guys to experience. We want you to try something new, don't be afraid, and have lots of fun. Okay, so the first part, Coach Lyle worked with just hands, and now Ryder's going to demonstrate kicks. Because Muay Thai is part, you have hands, knees, elbows, and kicks. Ryder. Okay, who wants to volunteer to do that? Uh, just joking, but we do have a volunteer. <laughs> Thank you again, Ms. Sharif, for having us. We just want to give you a little bit of taste of what we do. Okay. All right, so that's some of the things that we want to actually get you guys engaged with, okay? So you, you give us what we need, we're going to give you what you need, right? I work extremely hard to find money to keep you active after school so we won't have unfortunate percentages ending up on this side like these ladies and gentlemen did, ending up in the system because they didn't have certain opportunities or some of them had opportunities just chose to do stupid stuff. 
So we want to make sure we can provide those things for you. That's why this program was dissolved. Okay? We want to make sure that I'm trying to take away your excuses. That's just the bottom line. If we give you things and you don't take it or choose to use it, then that's on you. We've given you the education of the do's and don'ts. We're providing you an activity so you can do whatever you want up to $150. And also, Jojo, go in the, that closet right there, please, in that room, and bring me those two boxes on the top of the chair, uh, top of the table there. We're going to get started here shortly. But here's the thing. The ultimate goal for us is to make sure that we help you stay on the right path. Some of you are brought here from your parents because they see you going in a little bit different direction that you shouldn't, right? Some of you are court ordered. Some of you are here because, put it right here, honey. This is my daughter. She plays softball. Let's give her a round of applause. Joe, Joe, where's my son, Xavier? Oh, he's at the bathroom. So we want to make sure all these kids who are getting funded right now in the white graduate T-shirt stand up. Stand up. Okay. Oh, yes. And we're missing about five of them or six of them. These kids come back every month to get funded for their activities. So this, month, this program is three months long right now. When you graduate, you can still get funded, providing our funding keeps coming in. So they come back every month. They have to wear their T-shirts, and they give us four hours of community service, and I just keep cutting checks to these companies and where these kids are going and doing their activities. $225,000 given away to kids' activities so far. Over 167, I think it is, kids that are 200, excuse me, 67 have been sponsored with activities over the last 10 years, almost 10 years. All right? Yes. So we want to continue to bring forth for the new kids in the program, the second time in, and the third time graduates. We want to make sure that you get everything you need from this program, starting with being educated first by our speakers. This is not just about giving money away. This is about learning life lessons through our speakers who've been there and done that. And you're going to hear these testimonies in a minute. And that 10% that I'm asking of you to give your attention to, I'm expecting it from you. Okay? Go ahead and sit down, please. The last thing I want to share with you before we turn it over to Mr. Ray, who's going to give you the information to start with. If you are involved in an activity, and let's say you don't have anything to do for that month, or you're taking a break because you're playing high school football, softball, basketball, and you're not on your club team, or you're not on your summer team, we don't pay for you to not do the sport, but you need equipment. We pay for that up to $150 a month, too. This is a byproduct of that. Charlie, come on up here, girl. Get your glove. I used to coach Charlie. I used to, I used to coach TT and a couple other kids that aren't here right now. This is a glove we purchased for her. She's on the high school softball team. We're not funding her travel team because she's playing high school, but she can still get equipment for that. Show them your glove. That's a $300 glove, but we paid for half of it. Okay? We want to help you because why? I'm taking away your excuses. Where's, where's the other box? TT, come on up. Talisha plays softball too. Oh, you need a new bat, Joe? You better get a job, girl. Them bats are $500. <laughs> $500 for them bats. <laughs> Jeez. Talisha's getting a new bat bag because she's in the program still, and she graduated two years ago? About two, three years ago. So we don't want to stop. We want to keep funding you. You give to me through respect, good grades, graduating, Treating your parents right? Treating your teachers right? Huh? Treating people right, period. So there's no excuses here. And guess what? If you can't get to your activity, we got bus passes too. So help us help you get to the next level. Okay? Find something you want. <coughs> and again... 
If you are doing absolutely nothing after school, that's a problem. Sorry. Get off your phones. Get off your TV. Get outside and become active, doing something. Whatever it is. is you want to dance? We'll pay for that, too. We got dancers in here, too. But we won't pay for if you got a pole and you're dancing. We're not doing that. Okay? We want to bring you to the next level, so help us. All right? I'm from a family of 12. I didn't have much. Nine, number nine, eight boys, four girls. And I played basketball and softball. That's the only reason I'm here. I got a scholarship to go to UNLV. Get my book. It shares everything about my life, pretty much. Our speakers, our students here, our successes. That's what we want for you guys. So help us help you take it to the next level. The last thing I'll share, and I'm going to let the speakers go here. The last thing, those of you who are getting arrested, okay, those of you who are here because you're getting arrested, armed robberies, stealing vehicles, kicking in doors, <laughs> you better get ready. Jumping out of windows, runaways, okay? All of that you're going to hear because guess what? Been there, done that. And I'm going to let them share their testimony. I'm not going to steal their thunder. All right? We got it? All right, so now what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the parents, all the new parents, please, you're going to go across the hall into the parent group. You're going to be over there for about an hour, and then we'll bring you back in once we actually finish with the kids, and we're going to feed everybody, and we'll have our closing guest speaker. So parents, please go to the other side. Who's in my parent group? Tanisa, where's the other parent group, folks? Thank you, Lyle. If you are interested in kickboxing or any Muay Thai boxing, let me know. Mr. Lyle has, a, has his program. He told you where it was, but we want to get you guys active. All right? All right. Parents on the other side. Kids, stay here. Oh, yeah, sorry. I thought it turned. Thank you, honey. All right, Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray Dial is going to be your MC for the night. Come on, Mr. Ray. He's been with me for about seven years now. All right, Mr. Ray. Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? I couldn't hear you. How's everyone doing tonight? Good, 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 good. First thing I want to do is thank Ms. Cherie for giving us this platform to come and talk to you guys about your God-given ability to make good choices. Some of you guys have fallen short, but we're not going to throw in the towel yet. So this is what I need. I need you guys to listen up. Some of the stuff that the speakers have been through, you will experience that. You just got to remember, don't go down that path. You got to make good decisions, good choices. Everyone understand that? Good decisions, good choices. So listen up carefully. Our first speaker tonight, Ms. Terran, is 36 years old. It has been arrested multi times, multiple times for state and federal charges. She has served more than nine years between federal and state custody. Currently, she is on federal supervision. Her purpose for joining the program is to help others. She believes that changing the mindset of just one child can save their entire life. Let's give her a round of applause as she comes. Hi, everybody. My name is Taran. Um, I'm 36 years old, and I'm from Hawaii. Um, I grew up in a very good family full of singers, musicians, canoe paddlers, boxers. And um, when I was 14, I decided to take my own path. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna share my story so you understand 
what I've been through, how I got where I am today. Um, and in hopes it'll open your eyes and make you want to choose a different life. So um, when I was 14, it was a Why Not High School graduation night. Well, let me rewind. So before I, I tell you all the bad, I, I want to share the good too. So when I grew up, I was a sponsored surfer. I, I used to box. Um, I started recording music when I was a young girl. Um, I knew how to, I, like, I did so much things that I loved and I was recognized for at a young age. So um, my point of this story, of, of telling you this, is um, letting you know that one choice can change the rest of your life. Um, so at age 14, it was a Wai Night High School graduation night, and everybody was at the beach, everybody was partying, everybody, you know, was, had their trucks, everybody was drinking, they were playing their music, and one of my classmates, um, he, he asked me, oh, do you want to jump in with us? Let's go for a ride. Like, let's go to Taco Bell. So I'm like, okay. So I jump in the back seat of that car, and the driver was a much older man. The man, he was about 38 years old, so I'm 14 at the time. So this man was old enough to be my dad. And so we go through by the drive through and they run into somebody that they know. And they robbed that. So they both pulled out guns. They gunpoint this guy they robbed him took his pouch took his money took his chain took all his dope and when they jumped back in the car you know i'm 14 years old that's the first time i ever seen anything like that and they were like counting all the money you know took his chain they're all like look what we got i immediately thought that was cool i thought it was cool because i'm like oh i want to rob people i want to take people's money i want to get someone's chain and so immediately i wanted to be like them so I looked up to them. And um, later that night, when they were, they started to pass a glass pipe back and forth, and they were blowing clouds out of that pipe. And I was telling them, I want to try. And at first, they were like, no, you don't want to try this. I'm like, no, let me try. I want to try. And so that night, I tried crystal meth for the first time in my life. And I got really, really high. You know, I've never experienced something like that before. I never did drugs before. And, you know, so I'm smoking with a classmate and a man that's old enough to be my dad. So I'm, I'm getting high with them, you know, and it completely makes you forget all your responsibilities, makes you forget everything that's important. You know, you just feel good at that moment. And so later on that night, that older man took us up to an abandoned, not abandoned, it was an empty lot. And up that lot, there was a, a road that led to a big property. And on that property, there was an abandoned bus. This bus didn't have any windows. Well, there were windows, but they were broken. Um, there was a stool, and there was no chairs in this bus. There was beds and mattresses and blankets and futons and um, pillows. And we went in that bus and, and smoked. And we got high, you know, and we kept smoking. And so, um, you know, in the middle of all that, my classmate, he said, oh, I'm going to go to the store and I'll come back. And so I didn't think nothing of it, you know. I'm like, okay, I'll see you when you come back. Um, long story short, my classmate never came back. That man held me on that bus against my will. He held me hostage for 12 days. He beat me, drugged me, raped me, fed me sleeping pills so that I would fall asleep and he could do whatever he wanted to me. And every time I woke up and I had bites and bruises all over my body, my throat, because from him choking me, I couldn't swallow. And I would just cry and beg him, please, let me go home, please. And he was like, you ain't going nowhere. He would force me. So he would stand on the bottom step of the bus, and he would force me to use his water hose to shower in front of him while he would play with himself right in front of me. And I would cry, and I would say, please, just let me go home. My family's probably worried about me. Please let me go home. And he said, no, you're not going nowhere. And so, you know, after about 12 days, and the only reason I know is be because I counted every single day that I, since that graduation night. On day 12, he started falling asleep. He started nodding out, and I saw him getting tired. Immediately in my mind, I knew that I needed to make my move as soon as he falls asleep. And that was my chance to get away. So when he fell asleep, I took off running down the street. 
I didn't have no clothes. I had nothing but a sheet, the sheet that you put on your bed. I wrapped myself with that sheet. I was barefoot. I was dirty. I was broken. I was empty. I was ashamed. And I wasn't the same person. I wasn't the same curious 14-year-old that wanted to try drugs when I left. When I ran away, you know, I blamed myself because I thought, see, I, I shouldn't have jumped in the car with them. But I was so curious to try because I thought they were cool, not realizing that these people that I looked up to, that I wanted to be like, will be the people that changed the direction of my life. That one decision changed the direction of my life. So at age 14, I became a meth addict. By the age of 15, I was already living on the streets. I was living on the, on the streets. How many of you guys are 14 or 15? By that age, I was already living on the streets. And I'm talking about stealing from the stores to eat, stealing clothes from people's clothesline to have some clothes, using people's water hoses to take a shower, sleeping in abandoned houses because I didn't have no place to go, using a car battery to, to create electric to light, make a light, stealing water from the neighbor's water hose to fill up buckets so I could flush the toilet in the abandoned house, sleeping on sidewalks, running food out the store because I didn't have no money. And I was, I was doing this at age 15. When my family found out that I was using, they wanted nothing to do with me. At this age, my mom was already, my mom and dad had already divorced, so my mom was living in a whole other state and had no clue what was happening. But all I knew was that I never wanted to give my family the chance to say, see, I told you so. You see when you want to cruise with dummies? You see when you think you're grown? You see when you just do what you want? You see what happens? I didn't want to give them that chance. So what I did was I kept that secret. I kept that secret my whole life for almost 18 years until I finally told my mom what happened. And it broke her. You know, she even blamed herself. And I said, it's, it's nobody's fault. It's my own fault because I'm in charge of my own choices. You know, somebody can, can give me drugs. Someone can tell me, try this. But it, ultimately, it is my choice. So when, at age of 14, I became a full-blown meth addict, doing crime, robbing houses, stealing cars, trying to get, like, getting into shootouts with drug dealers. Like, I did so much at such a young age that I no longer was a child. I went from, from living to surviving. You know, at, age, at your age, you guys get to experience you know, dances and proms and, you know, getting to graduate and walk across the stage, receive your diploma. I never, ever got to re ever experience those things. By age 14, I was already smoking drugs. I was already addicted to drugs. I didn't care about my family. I didn't care about nothing that was important. I didn't care about my talent or the opportunities that was given to me. I didn't care about the sponsorships that I had for surfing or the opportunities I had for singing because nothing was important anymore. All I wanted to do was stay numb. Stay numb and forget what happened to me. Stay numb and pretend like I was good. Stay numb and pretend like I didn't feel nothing. Pretend everything was okay because that's what drugs does. When you get high, basically all your priorities, everything you care about, all your morals, your values, all of those things blow out with the smoke. You no longer, all those things are no longer important. People who have kids that get high, they no longer care about their kids. They no longer care if their kids ate today or if they're going to come home. All, all I cared about was continuing to stay high. And so my career as a criminal began. I was arrested 44 times. I was Hawaii's most wanted. And I did nine years and nine months in prison, federal and state. I've been to six different states, did time in six different states. And so, unfortunately, that's the only type of road trip I ever had, was going from prison to prison. Okay? And one thing is when you're in prison, you no longer get to choose anything for yourself. You no longer get to choose what clothes you wear. You ain't going to get no Victoria's Secret. You're going to get one white sports bra with one white grandma panty. You don't get to choose when you shower or what you eat or when you can shower. You have 10 minutes to eat, 5, 10 minutes to shower, and you shower at 5 in the morning or 4 in the afternoon. You don't get to choose. You don't get to just walk to the phone and call your family. 
You don't get to do none of that because they choose it for you. They don't care if your mom's out dying and you're locked up. They're not going to give you an extra phone call because they do not care about you. When you're in prison, you lose everything. And that happened to me. You know, I was in prison and I lost my uncle who, who raised me. He passed away. And guess what? I couldn't even go to his funeral. You lose everything when you're inside. And you know, one thing I realized every time I went in was that everything, all the people that I, I spent my time with were all people that could care less about me. They could get, care less if I walked into the street and got hit by a bus. They don't care. As long as I was still able to provide for them, I was, as long as they could still get high with me or, or come, you know what I mean? Like, no one cares. Like, there is no love and no true friendships in those streets because it's every man for themselves. So, you know, I know a lot of you guys, you guys want to grow up to be gangsters and drug dealers, and you think it's cool to rob people, kick in doors, sneak out at night, take people's stuff. Because guess what? I thought it was cool, too. But I lost 15 years. I was an addict from 14 to 29. 15 years, I could not stop using drugs. 10 years of my life, I was behind bars. 10 years, I cannot get back. Now, you do the math. 15 years on drugs and 10 years in prison. That's 25 years of my life that I cannot get back. Do you think if I got to do it all over again, I'd want to waste that much time? Hell no. Do you think I knew that night when I went and jumped in the car to go to Taco Bell with my friends, do you think I knew that that night would change the direction of my life? Do you guys think that I thought I was going to get raped by that guy? Of course not. Do you think that when I tried drugs because I was so curious that I thought I was going to become addicted for the next 15 years? Of course not. So I'm telling you right now, you guys might think it's cool to, to, to get high, to try drugs, or your, you know, your friends. I'm sure half of you probably experienced it. Your friends probably offered you, hey, you want to smoke something? Drugs is not a game. Drugs is not a game because it is sent to kill, steal, and destroy everything good in your life. So um, I have a brother. He was age 20, and he was nothing like me. He was a good kid. He was a straight-A student. You know, he was to, kept to himself, never got into trouble, never bothered nobody. And um, it was two weeks before he turned 21. My brother went with his friends, and they were all drinking alcohol at a rave. And one of his friends gave him a pill to try. So my brother tried this pill for the first time, and within 10 minutes, my brother's heart stopped, and he died. In 10 minutes, because he wanted to try. Guess what his friends did? They left him. They left him because they were so scared of getting in trouble because they gave it to him that they left him and they ran away. And so guess what? After they tested my brother, and they said if they, he would have got help, that they could have possibly saved him. But his friends were too worried about themselves in my brother's life. So he was left there to die alone at age 20, his life cut short, all from one choice, one choice. Do you think that night when he was having fun, and everyone's popping pills, he thought that would be his last minutes alive? Of course not. So I'm telling you, I'm not standing here for my health. I'm not standing here because I get paid to, to be here. I'm here for free. I'm, this, is, this is me on my free time because you guys are important. I'm not here because I get paid to do this or because this is my career. I'm here to save your life. Because it's not a game. You guys, like I'm telling you, before you get so curious, you guys want to go on and experience things. Listen to my life. Listen to what I lived. Listen to my experience, the mistakes I, I, I made, and the price I paid. Don't let that be you. You guys don't have to relive and remake the same mistakes that I made. Take what I'm saying. Listen to it. Because I'm not up here to waste your time. I'm not your teacher. I'm not your parent. I didn't go to college for this. I lived it. I survived it. Okay? What I'm saying, you can trust. I'm not sugarcoating nothing. I didn't learn this out of no textbook. What I'm saying is real and raw. Drugs is not a game. 
And before you guys think that you want to grow up to be drug dealers, I'm telling you, I was a drug dealer, and it all comes to an end. Either prison, death, or you lose your mind. I have friends, I have friends that had everything. One of my friends, we used to go to his house all the time because his house was the party house. He had all the money, all the TVs, all the cars. He had a big house, so we all go to his house to chill. One time, somebody gave him crack. To this day, he is walking on the side of the road, talking to himself, living in the bushes. He sold everything he had, his TVs, his couches, his cars. Next thing you know, he's homeless. He is still addicted today. And every time I visit home, I pass him on the streets, and I get so sad because I knew him when he was good. I've lost so much people in my, in my life, in my addiction. My ex-boyfriend got stabbed 40 times over a drug deal that gone bad. He's dead. Another one of my exes got shot in his face. To this day, he walks around with a fake eye. Somebody else I know got shot twice in his stomach over a small amount of dope. He survived, and today he wears a colonoscopy bag. Every time he uses the bathroom, we can see his shit. We can see his pee. Anytime. Because you know why? He has to empty that bag every single time. One of my good friends got beat to death over a half gram of meth. Another one shot up dope in her arm, and it killed her. I can go on and on and on and tell you guys how many people that I lost, how many people that I've seen lose their life. But I'm not going to stand here and, and, and lecture you guys or waste your time. But I came here to share my story so that maybe, just maybe, one of you actually paid attention to what I said and, and choose something different. Because you're going to have to face a choice. There's going to come a time when you have to choose yes or no, and that choice is what's going to change the rest of your life. So I urge you to pay attention to what I said, because I promise you everything I said is from my heart. And I came here because you guys are important and because I hope that what I shared can change your mindset. I know what it's like to be your age. I know what it's like to be curious. I know what it's like to think I'm grown. So I'm urging you to just take what I shared today, take it with you. When that moment comes when you have to choose, I urge you to choose the right way. Choose right. Be a leader. You guys have dreams. Follow your dreams. Chase your dreams. Don't let anybody tell you that you cannot. It doesn't matter if you come from the hood, if you come from a rich family, black, white, Mexican, Hawaiian, anything. It doesn't matter. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not good enough or that you cannot because you can. Thank you guys so much for letting me share. Um, thank you. <laughs> Test one, two, three. Yes, you've just heard the good, the bad, and the ugly, ugliness of your choices. Who took something away from that? Who took something away from that? What did you take away? Okay, she said it. She said it really inspired her by listening to the to uh, Miss Taran's story. Anybody else? Give me give me two more things that you took away from that. How long How long was she on drugs? Go ahead. Go ahead. The consequences of your actions and how every choice is going to affect you.
Okay. 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 Good. Let's give him a hand. Yes. Also, let's give Miss Turan a hand. I just want to, I want to let you guys know. We have jobs. We work pretty much the whole day, and then we take our time to come here to speak to you. Why? Because we care. We care about each, each of you. We want to help you, not hinder you. We want to provide information to you to help you Make some good decisions from this day forth. Because trust me, you don't want to get caught up in the system. Once your name goes in there, there's, there's no end to it. There's no end to it. And it's very hard. Now our next speaker is Mr. Ray. He is 54 years old, has served a total of 19 years in federal custody. He was also involved in the juvenile system. Mr. Ray has been involved with Real Talk since October 2012. His purpose for joining the program is to help change the lives of youth. Mr. Ray has remained crime-free since his release from custody. He is employed full-time, he is an author, and he was awarded early termination from supervision last year as a result of being a lawful, abiding citizen. Everyone, give Mr. Ray a hand of applause. Welcome. Testing, how we doing, everybody? First of all, I want to tell Teron that, you know what? My heart goes out to her. I pray for her. I love her as a sister, and, you know, she's a beautiful person. That's all I, I mean, she's, whew. Okay, how many, how many of you youths are here by the court, from the court? Okay. And how many are here because they got in trouble at home? Okay. And how many are here because they want to be here? Oh, so we got some that want to be here. Volunteers. Okay. So let me, um, I'm just going to take you on a little journey of my life story back when I was you know, young, like you youngsters. So I grew up in uh, Wilmington, California. Uh, anybody know where Wilmington, California is? By Long Beach, San Pedro, Torrance, you know where it's at? Okay. So where I grew up, my role models were gangbangers and drug slangers. Um, the, the area where I grew up, there was the Dana Strand projects and you had kids out there that were 12, 13, 14 years old selling drugs that they had low rider cars and they weren't even old enough to drive. They had Dana, um, they had Dana rims on them. They had hydraulics and they weren't even old enough to drive. That's, I mean, there was so much drugs in the uh, drug activity w w in the area that I was growing up. And me, I was bumping heads with my parents, my father, my mom, and I ended up getting kicked out at age 14 years old. So I got kicked out on the street, and I was living uh, from friend to friend. I was staying at their houses. We were running the streets. And I remember one of the, one of the most times that really, really st st sticks out today is I remember I was, I was on Gaffey Street, 
it was late at night. Me and my friend we were over there breaking in cars, stealing car stereos. And I remember running, getting ready to cross the street, a boulevard, and there was an oncoming car. And I wanted to cross the street before that car, you know, before the car passed me. So I crossed and I looked, and it was actually my parents driving by. And my mom looked at me, and I don't know if she realized it was me. It was my mom, my dad, and my little brother. They were actually on their way to move to Las Vegas. That was the last time. And I was like, and I looked at them, and they didn't, like, to me, it's just like, they just kept going. And at that age, I'm wondering, like, damn, who, what, what kind of parent would do something like that? Like, how, how would a child feel if that was their parent that just left them there for the streets to raise them? Because that's, that's how I felt. I felt like a, a discarded, you know, piece of trash. But that's, that began my journey into survival mode, what I call survival mode. So for me, sleeping from friend's house to friend's house, stealing car stereos, stealing things from the stores, um, you know, similar to Tehran, uh, I never got involved as far as using drugs. I smoked a little bit of weed back then. Um, I was more into trying to make money. Uh, did I use drugs here and there? Yes, I did. So eventually I started staying with my sister. My sister lived right up the street from the Dana Strand Projects. And then, you know, I was, I had dropped out of school. Okay, I had dropped out of school. I'm used to, I was going to school with holes in my shoes and wearing the same clothes from the year before. And you know, growing up like that, it's, it's like, man, you know, it's, it's rough, especially when you're a kid because, you know, people make fun of you, right? You know, I don't know if anybody has ever experienced that. But eventually, um, I got involved in selling crack cocaine. So I, I borrowed $20 from this girl that liked me, right? So I got a double up 20 from the drug dealers, and then I, I doubled it, so I got 40. And so I kept doing that every day until I started buying ounces. And then once I started buying ounces, I saved up for a quarter key. And then I, I'll say, there's, there's no such thing as a successful drug dealer, but I'll say I was semi-successful. Then I started buying kilos. And then the, the people that were supplying me um, with the ounces were like, Man, you, you're buying too much. I, I, we, we don't have kilos. So they introduced me to another connection that was actually selling kilos. And I started doing what, you know, what I thought was good. So by age 18, when I started, all I wanted was clothes, a car, and like $5,000. Once I got that, the, you know, the bar went up. So I wanted two cars. I wanted more money. It just it doesn't stop. It's, like, it's almost like using drugs. You get addicted to money. You get addicted to the lifestyle, especially if you grew up poor and you didn't have anything. So um, growing up in that neighborhood, the, the cops, you know, when, you, when, you, when you're driving around in a new blazer and you're freaking 18 years old and you got dating rims and people start noticing you, people start getting jealous. So eventually the cops started knowing I was a drug dealer. And how, how, they, how, how I knew they were watching me, one of, the, one of the guys that I was selling dope to came to my house and he, you know, to pick up an eight ball, eight, you know, uh, three and a half grams of uh, cocaine. And then the next day, he called me up. He says, uh, "He says, hey, Ray, you know, when I went to work that night, uh, the next day, my, um, my boss told me to stay away from the house that I, that I was at the night before. It's a known drug dealer. And he was the only house I was at was yours. Because that company that he worked for was a tire company. They used to change all of Metro's tires and all the undercover cars' tires. So one of the undercovers told his boss, and he came back and told me. So what I did is I packed up all my stuff, and I moved to Las Vegas. My parents had already lived here, and they were trying to come in contact with me and trying to get me to move here. They heard that I was selling drugs and this and that, and they, you know, for some reason they wanted me out here. And, but I had a couple of friends out here that were already selling drugs. Or actually one that lived here, he was semi-selling drugs. So when I moved out here, what do you think I brought with me? Brought the sack. And Vegas was 
see, I moved out here in 1986. Vegas was like criminal college for me. So I learned everything about chop shops, about credit card fraud. I learned about drugs I had never even heard of. And then so I was actually doing better for myself. I started getting involved in, in <clears throat> you guys all right over there? Is he bothering you? <laughs> Are you sure? Okay. So I started getting involved. I mean, if there was money to be made, I wanted a piece of it. That's just how my mentality was. Um, but there was always the consequences in the back of your mind that, oh, I might get busted someday. So if, in my mind, I'm thinking, hey, okay, I'm going to get busted. I'm going to look at five years. Five years, I could do five years. Five years, no big deal. So in 1995, um, I had $2 million worth of stolen artwork from, that were stolen from Las Vegas entertainer Wayne Newton. Has anybody heard of Wayne Newton? So they Mr. Las Vegas. So I had artwork, and my job was to get rid of it on the black market. The black market is a market where they sell illegal stuff, stolen goods. So I, I, I brokered a deal. Um, I had a co-defendant that I met. He was an ex-city city, uh, manager of Coachella, and he introduced me to some Colombians. Go ahead. What guards? Where I got the artwork? Okay. You're going to have to read my book. Hold on there. I'll give you the book to read. How's that? So anyways, I, I, the contacts I had to answer your question. So one of my mentors was an Italian. I was actually one of the first Latinos to work with the Italians back in the 80s. One owned the alarm company. So how do you think he knew how to bypass alarms and get through locks and lock up everything back up like it was never even open? That's the kind of people I was hanging out with. So we got the artwork, and I, tr I tried to sell it. I tried to broker a deal with some Colombians who we didn't know got busted by the feds. They got busted in Miami, and they were working for the uh, DEA, and they are working for a bunch of other agencies too. So I tried to trade 110 pounds of cocaine, 50 kilos of cocaine for the artwork, and I got caught in a reverse sting operation. And what, which part? The reverse thing operation. So the, a reverse thing operation is where the police or the DEA or the feds try to sell you, FBI too, they try to sell you drugs, right? And then you attempt to buy it. So they call that a reverse thing operation. Instead of you selling them drugs, they try to sell you drugs. And then they, they it's, it's, it could be a conspiracy case. But yeah, they ambushed me with a lot of time, that's for sure. So, yeah, you're right about that. So, so I got arrested, and so I was 26 years old. I even remember the room that I got arrested. I remember it was room 1516 of the Marriott Hotel, and it was May 24th, 1995. It was in room. Uh, it was a uh, 6:05 p.m. arrest time, and so when I got arrested, they take you to a Metropolitan Detention Center, which is in L.A. And when I walked in, I'm like, I, I was tired. I don't know. I, they put you in these little holding tanks, and, and, and the first thing I did is I laid down. I'm like, you know what? I need to sleep. So I grabbed a – there's no pillow, so you got to use toilet paper as a pillow just to put your head on. So that's what I did. And I woke up, and, you know, I'm thinking, like, okay, this is a dream. This, is, this ain't happening. This is, this is all a dream. Let me see that. Looks like you're having too much fun with that. Let me see that. Hmm? Yeah, you shouldn't be doing that, though. Okay, so – so to me, it felt like it was a dream, and thank you, brother. But reality set in. Actually, for a while, it, it felt like a dream. But when you get sentenced to 19 years, seven months, the when I got sentenced, if I felt like I felt like a sledgehammer hit me in my chest. Because I was only 26 years old. To me, that was like a whole life sentence. Most of my life, I will spend in prison because I was 26 years old. How many people could do 20 years in prison? Kids. How many people want to do 20 years? You, you want to do 20 years? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through a few things and so you can think about prison once you get there. So... First of all, dealing with 19 years, seven months, 
and you're only 26 years old, like I said, to me, that felt like it was a life sentence to me. Like, I started thinking, like, how old am I going to be when I get out? I'm going to be old. Damn. But I took one day at a time, one day at a time, and never lost hope. So I had to do a total of 18 years in prison for a first time, first time nonviolent drug offense. Did you know you can get in trouble for drugs without even getting caught with drugs? It's called conspiracy. Okay? So say if you're selling drugs, right, to him, okay, but oh, you want to come up here and uh, entertain everybody for us? You do? Oh, oh, real talk police is going to get you. You better watch out. So if, if you sell drug to, drugs to, to, to him, right, and say you get caught, right, and you d decide to you know, work with the police and everything, you don't have to necessarily get caught with the drugs. Say if there's a phone call, say if you're making a phone call and you're doing it over the phone, they can get you on a phone call and tie you in with other people that you don't even know that he might, you might, he might be selling to or he might be selling to. So it's, it's all a conspiracy. They get all these people in one big old net, and they, put, they, they build a case around them, even though you might not know 10 of these people. But just because you're no one person, I mean, you might have made a transaction with somebody else, and some of those people you don't even know, they can still charge you with drugs that, you, that they never even caught you with. Just because of a phone call, you're saying, yeah, yeah, I'll bring you, you know, I'll bring you an ounce or whatever. And they might even just cut him with one ounce. They'll be like, hey, how long have, uh, has he been selling you ounces? Oh, he's been selling me an ounce uh, you know, once a week for the last five years. They'll add up all those drugs together, and that's what they'll charge you with. Whatever it depends on the amount. You can get the mandatory minimum in prison, most people, 10 years is what a lot of people get in federal, in federal prison. 10 years. 10 years is nothing. Like, oh, you got 10 years? Oh, okay. Let's go. But when you're getting like 200 years, 300 years, then you're like, oh, damn. You're like, exactly. So how many, how many, uh, how, how many youngsters here are involved or know somebody that's involved with the gangs? Anybody? So, okay, gangs. Okay. So do you know what happens? Does anybody know about politics in prison when it comes to gangs? What do you know? What are you talking about? Okay, okay, but that's not what we're talking about. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're, hey, we're gonna have to tie you up somewhere pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm going to tell you what they, okay, if you go to prison, I'm going to give you a private, if you go to prison, honestly, and you got a bunkie that has 300 years, and you have that attitude, I know you're, you're a happy guy, and you're, but if you talk too much, even in prison, you know what happens? You're smashed. You know what I'm saying? Do you know what smashed is? No, not that kind of smashed, oh my God. Yeah, they, it does. Uh, yeah. What, where do you find this guy at? Where do you find this guy? So, uh, boy, this guy. Something's wrong with this guy. Man, okay. So, see, I'm, I'm even, like, threw me off a little bit. Damn. So, going back to prison. Prison is, is a serious place to be. We're going to put you in the back over there, okay? Cherie, can you put him in the back over there? Okay. Because we don't want no more disruption. I know it's funny, whatever, yeah, but you know what? This is a serious matter, especially when you're in prison. You're looking at 20 years, 19 years, um, and somebody, so, say if you got a celly. Well, let me give you a prime example on, on a real-life situation that happened where when you're when you're in prison that with people that are not getting out, they have a different mentality. Okay, sometimes they don't care. They don't care about hurting other people. If you got a ten-year sentence, you care about going home, right? 
even a 20-year sentence, you care about going home. Some people don't have that mentality. So one of the incidents, where I remember we were in the chow line, and everybody's in line waiting in line for their chow or to get milk. One thing about prison, you have to get respect or, or give respect to everybody. If you don't, who knows what could happen. The worst case scenario is that you, they'll probably take your life. Smashing you means knocking you out, killing you, stabbing you, hitting you in the head with a weight or whatever. People do get raped in prison too, though. And that's not a funny matter. I've seen, I've seen things happen to young people, kids. Or young, when I say kids, you know, they're you know, younger than me. It does happen. So... Somebody decided, some knucklehead decided to cut off, you know, everybody else that were standing in line in the milk line, and the guy went back to a cell, and somebody stabbed the hell out of him for that. Why do you think he did that? Why do you think the, the guy got stabbed? No, I'm not giving you, no, no, you're, I'm done with you. Somebody else. Because of respect. How many people are disrespecting their parents? Okay, well, at least he's honest. Right? So prison is all about respect. If you disrespect somebody that has 300 years, you think, he, you think he cares if he gets another, you know, another 20 years or if somebody has three life sentences, you think he cares if he gets another life sentence? He's not getting out. He's not going home. Matter of fact, you got people in prison that are looking for victims so they can stay with them. Somebody that they can get in trouble, maybe stab somebody and take another man's life so that person won't get out. That's how some of these people think that are never getting out. Okay? So the politics in prison also is if you have, say if, say if you got friends, say if you have a friend that's Latino and black, two, a black and a Latino that are friends, right, on the street, and they go to prison, there's politics. Say there's a riot that jumps off. Do you think the black and the Latino are going to be friends in prison? Now, they can talk to each other and they can communicate, but you think that they're going to be backing each other up in prison? No. There's politics. The blacks have their TV. The Latinos have theirs. The whites have theirs. The islanders have theirs. <clears throat> and if you disrespect any of those races, there's consequences. They will not let a Southsider fight by himself against a black. What's going to happen is everybody has to fight. And they're, they're not going to be like, oh, he disrespects you, go heads up. No. They're like, nah. All of us, all the Southsiders are fighting with the blacks, and we're going to tear up the whole yard. That's just how it is. Well, the police can do They can try, but, you know, it ain't like anybody's going to tell them before it happens. It just happens, and then, you know, so... That's just how it is. And then if the police get involved and then they start the gun tower, start shooting, you can lose your life from that. That's just how it is. When I went to prison, I didn't want to be there for a long time. I'm like, I didn't like it. So eventually I decided I had to change the way I, you know, the, the way I think. So I was a high school dropout. Eventually I started taking college classes. You got to get your GED or your high school diploma in prison. I started thinking about my life, which way I'm going. Um, I started, you know, my passion is filmmaking and writing, but I was a high school dropout. I was, I was actually, I couldn't even, I was too shy to talk in front of crowds when I was younger. And it, it, I was too shy to, to read in front of people. But I started, I started telling myself, you know what, I need to get past that. I need to, I need to better myself. I need to, I need, I need to get out of my comfort zone. And I, I need to change the way I think. And I need to change my environment, the people I hang around with. And I was the worst influence, so I had to change me. So I started taking college classes. I started taking apprenticeship programs. I started writing movie scripts when I was uh, in prison. I started taking, writing journals. Um, when I got out, I got out of prison um, April 5th, 2011. And I came back to Las Vegas. And... You know, being an ex-felon, you wonder, like, okay, what kind of job could I get? But honestly, in my heart, I didn't feel like it was an issue for me. Like, because just because my body was locked up all those years, my mind was never locked up. 
I was always in the books. I was reading about the stock market. I was reading about real estate. I was reading about investing. I was reading about everything I, I could read about that had to do with movies, movie production. So when I got out, I got a job at a transportation company. And to me, it was, I mean, it was a great opportunity. I could wear a three-piece suit all day. I can drive some of the most luxurious, luxurious cars. I mean, the Rolls Royces. The well, I, Actually, they put me in a beat-up old car at first. It was a beat-up old car. Actually, it was kind of the oldest car in the fleet. But within six months, I was already driving the owner's car, which was a Rolls Royce. And even people at the company are like, damn, who's this guy? Like, well, I mean, I've been here 10 years. I haven't even drove his car. But it's because I have a passion, you know, for what I do. So I do. So I have my own company now, LV VIP Concierge LLC. I work with some of the biggest artists in the world, Bad Bunny, Mariah Carey, Elton John, and the list goes on. I mean, it, it, it's, it goes to show you that once you put your mind to something and you focus on, on what you want to do and you cut out all the BS, that you can thrive. I got, I'm working on my second book now. My first book, I won a International Latino Book Award. I got movie stuff I'm working on. James Patterson, anybody know James Patterson? One of the biggest authors in the world Any, for, for readers. James Patterson's co-author just, uh, just interviewed me. His name is Mark Seal. He's a writer for Vanity Fair for their next book about Vegas. So my character, my name, what I do as a VIP chauffeur is actually in his next book. So... Who would ever think a kid growing up in the hood, getting kicked out, selling drugs, that I would be this far? I mean, I get invited to concerts, Red Hot Chili Peppers. I get invited to the, the Rolling Stones. I mean, I, for, because of what I do and the people that I work with. So the bottom line is just because you start off bad doesn't mean it has to end that way. People make mistakes, but people could turn it around too. My time is almost up. Does anybody have any questions before I, before I close up? No, nope. you're restricted. You got a gag order. <laughs> Who else? Nobody? Have I seen? I've seen many of them. How do they use the end? Usually what they'll do, either somebody will, most likely somebody will end up injured or dead. And once the goon squad comes and takes control of everything, locks everything down, they start shipping. Well, they, they interview everybody in the whole prison. They, they lock everybody down. They interview. They, go, they pull you out of your cell and they interview by yourself. You don't have to say nothing or you do, but most times you got somebody that's saying something. And then once they finish, done, finish with their investigation, they'll get all the people that they thought were involved and they'll ship them. You could, they could, if you're in the feds, they can ship you and you're staying, maybe they have you housed in California, they can ship you back east somewhere away from your family. They, ship, they spread everybody, all, all, you know, like different, part, different states in the federal system. So, and then usually you'll, um, if they find out, you know, who did it or if there's somebody, if you, somebody stabs somebody, they'll, they'll bring up new charges. And so just because you got a 10-year sentence and you stab somebody, say they die, then they can charge you with his murder. So you can actually get new charges in prison. Yeah. One more question. Oh, yeah. That's a very good question. If you're biracial, you got to pick a side. you got to pick a side. If you are Mexican... And black, which there is, we call them blacksicans, and some of them even speak Spanish. So you have to pick a side. What side are you going with? You have to make a choice, because if there's a if there's if something jumps off, you got to be like, okay, I'm I'm running with my people. Same thing. You got to be. I mean, they have others, but they have people that you don't have. You don't have to run with the gang. But if you're not under the umbrella of a gang's protection, you're open game for whatever. They can do what they want with you. They can extort from you. They can, you know, bully you. They can, you know, ask for sexual favors or whatever. So that's why people go 
and they click up with the gangs, so they have protection. And you could be a, a you can be somebody that's not a gang affiliated and still get protection from a gang if you're paying them every month. But you got to pay them. You got to pay them money, or a commissary or whatever. Anything else? What's that? What did I roll? South side. Yeah. So, anybody else? Any? All right. That's my time. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Mr. Ray, before we start, I want all of you kids to stand up real quick and stretch. Just stretch. Oh, where's Alex? All right, you got another speaker, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ray's going to introduce to you. So sit back down, put your butts back in the chair. We have one more speaker before we eat, and then we'll have our closing guest speaker. Thank you. All right. Our next speaker is Mr. Garfield. He is 55 years old and served 12 years in prison and five months in jail and has successfully served his term of parole. His purpose for joining Real Talk is to give back. Also, he believes that hearing from people that lived a certain life can steer youth away from making bad choices. Let's give him a warm round, Mr. Garfield. Hello, how's it going, everybody? All right, uh, first of all, I'm doing this because I, I have an obligation. I've been, uh, I, I look at like my experiences that I had in life and I, at one point it didn't make any sense to me, but now it, uh, I've survived a lot of stuff and it, I, it serves a purpose for me today. Like what I went through, maybe I can help one person down, you know, so they don't have to make the same decisions I made, or if they're going through something, struggling with something, maybe I could be used to uh, help them get through what they're going through. Uh, I, everything serves a purpose. It was a time in my life I didn't I think like that. So it's like, uh, it's, it's you know, I have a purpose today, and it's something that, uh, it's something that's happened as the God relationship with God. So just, I had to admit, mention God in my speech, uh, my little spill. But, uh, First of all, you guys getting, uh, I just want to let you guys know that uh, you're young and, you, you know, you're going to have to learn a lot of stuff on your own. But hopefully that you can listen to other people and uh, learn from their experiences, like us speaking, uh, us speaking to you guys. But I, I, I can tell you I've learned some things going through life. And one thing I've learned is that you can mind somebody, right? So right now you guys are all young. You, you can mind your parents. If you don't mind your parents, I'm sure uh, – they have a ways to deal with you, but when you get older and you get to make start, you know, having some freedom in your life, you can have some cho you can have some choices. But you're gonna mind somebody. You can't you you can't just do what you're gonna what you want to do without having to pay no consequences. And and you are able to do whatever you want to do, as long as you're willing to pay the price. If you're willing to pay the price, go ahead and you can you know, do it, right? But in regards of you gonna mind somebody, so when you get uh out of the house of your parents' house. You can go get a job. You can mind your boss. When you're out there in the streets, in society, you can mind the rules and the laws, or you're going to mind the police. And if that don't work out, they're going to send you to prison, and you're going to mind the COs, and you're going to mind whoever, whoever, like he was saying, about whoever running the, uh, the yard and stuff like that. But you're going to mind somebody. And, like, how old are you? Huh. Nine. So when you get married, you can be minding your wife when you get married, okay? So that's so when you look forward to that. But you can mind somebody. But I, I just wanted to let, uh, share with you guys about how, uh, look, I never got in trouble when I was younger, right? I've had some uh, traumatic ex stuff that had some adverse stuff that happened to me as a, a child. But as, in terms of, like, all throughout my, uh, through high school and junior high school and everything, I didn't start getting in trouble too late. So how does someone that could be a pretty good kid Eventually, I've been to prison eight times, you guys. Eight seven. Uh, I've been in front of a judge on eight different occasions, and the judge has sentenced me to prison, right? Seven times in California, and one time out here. And how does a person get to that place in life, right? So uh, we have these things. Miss Sh uh, Cherie, ha uh, they came up with these things right here, and I just wanted to touch on this subject about I am loved, right? 
So for some reason, for as long as I can remember, this is what happened to me, and this has a, a big effect on how I went the way I went. So I don't know what it was. At growing up, I never felt good about myself. I always compared myself to other people. I had a lot of shame and guilt. I think a lot of it had to do with what was going on at my house. Uh, I didn't have my father around. My father, I met him. I spent like a year with him uh, growing up. Uh, when I was seven years old, he passed away. And so uh, it was pretty much me and my mother and my brother, and uh, we had a stepfather. So what was going on at the house is that I never liked, I felt a lot of shame and guilt about my, my like the way I was uh, raised or whatever like that. And I don't know where this came from, right? Always compared myself to others. So I never felt comfortable in my skin. And so what happened was that uh, there was, my, my mother had married this guy. It was a stepfather and there was a lot of domestic violence going on. So what I start making mistakes in life is that, that there was things going on with me and I did not share it with anybody. I just kept it to myself and I just felt like I just kind of dealt with it and I just kind of thought I was strong enough to get through these experiences. But it was a, a terrible situation being at uh, a young uh, kid and having this man beating on my mother and thinking he's going to kill her, right? And not being able to do anything about it, like scared to go to sleep at night, but you hear the yelling and stuff like that. So what would go, happen, I would go to school and be with my friends and I, or be around my family, and I never talked to nobody about it. So there's things I was just suppressing that stuff. So what happened, ended up happening was that my mother started having issues with her mental health and uh, start using drugs. And I just remember at one time when I was 14 years old, she just took off. She just left. She abandoned me and my brother. They got to have my grandparents. They kind of swooped us up. But I took that personal, and I felt that abandonment that happened. And so I, uh, for some reason, I didn't love myself, and I know my mother don't love me. I don't have a father who loves me. So what happens was that I felt unlovable, right? And so I think that has a lot to do about the way I treated myself later on in life. Because the things I did to myself as a person is only a person that doesn't care about themselves is going to treat themselves the way I did, right? But at one time, if I had an uh, avenue like this and I had people that I could talk to, because I, you know, I felt a lot of shame and guilt. I didn't want to be different from everybody else, so I don't want to talk about this stuff that's going on in my house because I don't want no one to look at me in a certain way, right? So my mother, eventually, what ended up happening was she ended up going to the mental hospitals and and like all these little different places, but eventually she ended up taking her life. She killed herself, right? And still never talked about it. And my family members did the best way thing they could do. They, you know, they supported me and my brother. But I never had a, I never talked to nobody about this stuff. So what happens is that I kept this stuff to myself, and it was eating me up, eating me up, and eating me up. When I got to high school, I started experimenting with uh, alcohol and uh, and uh, weed. And I remember it was in my 20s. At one point, I was at this house and, uh, with these rich kids out there in Malibu, two-story house right there by the beach, and uh, they're doing cocaine. And once I did cocaine, that was like, it was a way for me to medicate myself. And I was like, oh, man, this is the perfect way for me to deal with my feelings. And that was the start of uh, a lot of uh, misery and suffering for me after that. So that cocaine, that line of cocaine, Maybe like a couple years later, I ended up on the streets in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, I gave up on myself, and I was running the streets. And this is like in the 90s and 2000s, and, uh, and uh, this is a very dangerous time. It was a lot of crime in L.A. at that time, and I was in these neighborhoods that were very dangerous. And uh, like, how, how do you, young, huh, 18? Oh, so maybe you like... If you're like, like, so the way that you look, not saying nothing bad about it, but there's the way that you look, there's so, like, it was so crazy in, the, in in those streets at that time, there was like, you could not cross the street to go to another uh, side of the street because at those times, you, you know, they would, they would, they would get at you, right? And there was like even places where they had parks where the parks were divided so you could cross. So you, people that only, they would be, uh, be stuck in just like a two or three blocks, that's their whole life. Because they can't go outside that block. Because they do, these youngsters are going to get you. These kids were like 14 years old in the middle of the daytime in front of everybody killing each other, right? 
So I'm in this environment because the drugs have got me out there. So I just wanted to let you guys know how bad I it got for me, how how I didn't value my life and how I didn't feel I was lovable. How uh, it was that uh, one time I'm out there in the streets around 1:30 in the morning and I'm walking around doing my thing and I I hear these gunshots and I look across the street there's a bus. And I, I, all I see is like the uh, when, when guns when guns go off in the middle of the night in, in the nighttime, all you do is see like this is like very bright uh, light. So I didn't see what happened. So, but what 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 I did find out I find out later was a man who got off the bus and got shot in the back. Somebody walked up on him and shot him a couple of times. So what happens when I heard the gunshots? There were some stairs. I walked up on the stairs, walked and I hid for like 10 seconds. So I said, let me get the heck out of here, right? And I start walking away, and this guy, this youngster just walks up on me. He's got a 9 millimeter gun and just lets me have it. He, he just unloaded his gun. So I got hit like seven times and ended up going to the hospital. See, I'll give you an example. See that? And so to let you know how, how, uh, how I didn't value my life was is that I, I stayed in the hospital for a month and a half, and when I get out the hospital, I'm in a wheelchair, and the taxi drops me off at home at my grandparents' house. And I remember the taxi taking off, and I'm in a wheelchair, and I look at my grandmother's house. Then I look towards the neighborhood, looked at my grandmother's house, and I said, well, let me go back out to the hood. So I went right back to the neighborhood while I'm recovering from my gunshot wounds to go back out and use drugs, right? And so uh, this went on for a long time, and I started getting in trouble. When I started getting in trouble... With uh, with the uh, uh, with with the drugs, it got me into a place to where I kept going in and out of prison, in and out of prison. I would get out, and I wouldn't change, and I would go right back to doing what I was doing before. And uh, that lifestyle, he was he was explaining to it like like that lifestyle, man. Like the, what's even worse than the uh, state prisons was I had to go through Los Angeles County Jail. And that was one of the most, uh, there was times where I didn't think I was going to make it out of there. But the uh, drugs had such a, uh, a grip on me that I had, uh, I had, uh, couldn't get out of it. So when I got out of here, and so what I was telling you guys about being, uh, not feeling love. So what happens was that I thought I had found love when I started selling drugs and I started having people they really, you know, like calling me all the time and want to hang out with me because I'm giving them drugs and I'm selling them drugs. And like I had around 100, before I went to prison this last time, I probably had 100 people on my phone and my phone was always going off. You know, I was the man. I thought I was the man. I was, you know, I had these people that always were giving me love and respect. And I, I kind of thought, I felt so bad about myself. That was the best thing I could do for my life was I had the value of my, my self-esteem was based on how big of a sack I had, right? But the cold reality was when I got busted and they were sending me to prison up here at High Desert, I was in that van and I realized I was going to be doing that time by myself and all those people that I thought were my friends and all that stuff were not going to, I was going to have to do that time by myself and they didn't care for me. They weren't going to send me no letters or nothing like that. Matter of fact, the girl I had, I think before I even made it to CCDC, she probably had another boyfriend and stuff like that, right? So that, that's, that's just how it was. But the reality kicked in at that point, and I realized about uh, the reality of the situation I put me in. So I would like to say everything was fine and dandy after that. But so what happens was that uh, what happened for me to change. So you guys at the age I'm at, so I had spent so much time in the system, you guys. So when I first started hanging out in the streets and I was homeless, they used to, they just, they'll give you a name like, oh, sure, that's Shorty. Oh, that's uh, that's too tall. That's black, whatever like that. So when I when I used to run the streets over there by MacArthur Park, they used to they gave me a name. But I, uh, at the age I was in my 20s and I looked kind of young. I was like, you know, I looked young, and so they used to call me youngster, right? So every place I would go into jails and the prisons and, the, and back on the streets, they would always call me that. So I remember this is how cold things are. I've been in the system so long. I've been caught up in the game so long. I remember I was in the county jail one time waiting to go to court. You know, uh, for another time, I'm, I'm about to go up to prison. And I remember sitting here, we're watching TV, and I see this guy looking at me, he say, hey, OG. And then uh, he's looking towards me, and I'm like, who's he talking to, right? And he said, hey, OG. And, then, and I realized he was talking to me. I'm like, holy cow, what the heck happened? Like, man, I was just... 
what, what, what happened to my life, man? My, my life is just flat. I was a youngster at one point. Now someone's calling me an OG, and, and I thought about it, the reality of my life. Like, man, this is crazy, man. What the hell happened to my life, man? So I'm just talking about, you, you know, my 20s, my 30s, and pretty much my, you know, t up to the early 40s. I was, uh, I was caught up in a system like that, man. It was, uh, it was like, uh, it was crazy. So what it, uh, to let you know where I'm at today, you guys, and to let you know that no matter how old you are, just don't give up, man. Whatever, if you guys have dreams and aspirations and stuff like that, you guys, uh, you guys leave it, everything you have on, on the field, man. Give everything that you have. And sometimes the thing that you guys are trying to aspire to get is going to take 10 years, 20 years, but just never give up because there's some, I, I, I don't really regret it no more because I have a purpose in my life, but there's things that I wanted to do when I was younger and I had just, I, I gave up on myself. I gave up on my dreams. And like, I have a brother. I was telling you guys about my brother. My brother never gave up. My brother is a musician. He's played with people like Dr. Dre, Snoop, Tupac, Madonna, Michael Jackson. My brother, he, he's, he's lived life. He didn't take the route like I, I took, right? So in regards to me being loved, when I, fight, when I start realizing that uh, I start, being, start taking better care of myself, and for me, it's about a relationship with God. Once I realized I was looking for love for all, in all the wrong places, once I realized for me that God loved me, my life changed. And I can start recognizing the love that people have in my life. So I start, the most important thing was I start loving myself, being okay with myself, and not comparing myself with others and being okay with who I am, right? So my, the reason I'm talking to you guys and me and Miss Ree had crossed paths right now is because this God I'm talking about had a purpose for me. And I used to thought I had buzzard luck all the time. It was like, who goes to prison eight times? What a dummy. I mean, I can't stay out of trouble, right? And I realized today that God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. What God was doing was he was protecting me. Because if I would have stayed in those streets for a significant amount of time, I would have got killed in those streets. I, I, I know that for a fact. So for me going in and out of prison because God was protecting me. And so this last time that God had put his hand in my life, I finally opened my eyes and recognized it. So when I got out of prison out here in, in, uh, out here in Nevada, is that uh, I thought, you know, California, you pretty much, I don't know, uh, she, was, uh, she was a federal probation officer. But in California, you pretty much went on parole, just don't get in trouble, and you're all right. But out here... That place on Bonanza, the PNP, that the lieutenant's not here today. Woo, man, they do not do not they do not play. So I stayed out of prison five days, and my parole saw me, and she said, "Oh no, 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 you don't know how to act." She put those cuffs on me, and she was she took me back to CCDC, wrote the paperwork, said, "Send this, this boy up. He don't know how to act. He he, he don't want to listen to nobody. You know, send him back to prison." And at the time, I didn't realize it, but uh. Uh, God had other plans. So what ended up happening was that I was supposed to go back and do a uh, finish up my time. After 30 days, my parole came to the, uh, the county jail and said, "Look, you got two choices. I'm gonna give you two choices, right? You can either go back to high desert, or you could go to this little rehab. I'm gonna send you to, right? <sighs> All right. So I still wasn't done with that life. I still wasn't done with the party and stuff like that. But I decided to give this place a chance. And, and uh, ever since, when I went there, at one point it was a struggle at first. But I, I got my uh, my life together, and I just kind of uh, got out the way. And this is part of where my life's at today. So you guys, at the age I'm at, and things, the things that happened in this short time for me is that, man, you guys have so much potential. You guys have so much uh, life ahead of you. Like for myself, it's finals week. I'm, in a, I'm at UNLV right now, in, in college right now. You know what I'm saying? Who would ever? Like, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but first of all, I'm not supposed to be out of prison. I mean, but just to be able to be, participate in life like I am, like I get to participate in things like this. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually, uh, work, I've been working. I work at a rehab. So I, I have the opportunity to get to uh, help others that are struggling. I get paid to do that. I'm in the process of, get, of getting uh, approved, my, my application approved by the, uh, the board of Nevada for the uh, counselors for drug and alcohol and gambling counselors. Yes. Like that. So all that stuff is like, uh, and this is happening. In uh, February, you guys, uh, three years off of drugs. I ain't did nothing in yes, three years. Yes, yes. No, no weed, no beer, nothing like that. 
But I, I just wanted to share with you guys, like I was telling you guys, you could do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to pay the consequences. But you're going to mind somebody, like I said. You know what I'm saying? You're going to mind somebody. Just you have a choice of who you're going to mind. You want to go mind the, uh, the COs in the prison or you want to go to work and mind your boss. So, it's, you know, it's up to, it's up to you. And um, other than that, you guys just kind of like uh, take our experiences that we have and the most important thing, if you want to know what you could do, is that the most important thing that you could do is like, hey, we all make mistakes, right? And don't beat yourself up on mistakes. So mistakes sometimes are the best uh, learning lessons of life. So when you make a decision later on, you're like, so oh, you know what? That didn't work out too, uh, too well last time. Let me try something different this time. Or you can listen to someone else share about what happened to them. And you're like, so you know what? OG was talking the other day. He said this happened. He did this that time. It didn't work out too well. Me, let me uh, make sure I don't do that. So it's important that you guys uh, take advantage of uh, the you know, information people give you. And it's all about when you get older. Uh, your uh, it's all the quality of your life is all gonna be based upon what kind of decisions you make. You know, it's like if you do good things, think good positive things that happen to you. If you do bad things, you got to pay a price for that. But really, it's gonna all come down. Your life's gonna come down to decision making. So you just kind of get in a habit of, of doing uh, the good things. And because when you start doing breaking the laws or start breaking rules, what happens is that. It might be small today, but you get in the habit of breaking the rules. The, uh, it's going to be tougher and tougher and tougher to say no when you have to say no. And it's going to be easier for you to, uh, when the bigger uh, 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 situations come up, you're going to be in the habit of just breaking, uh, you know, just being uh, breaking the rules. You're going to be in the habit, and it's going to, it might cost you your time, or it might, it might cost you time and your freedom, or it might cost you your life. And I think he had his hand up right here. What, what's going on? Is that, no, so I'm telling you guys, you're going to mind somebody. You guys understand what that means? You're going to listen to somebody. you got to have to follow somebody's rules, right? So that's why I was telling you, you're going to have to follow your wife's rules when you grow up, all right, when you get older. But uh, other than that, you guys, the most important thing is that uh, if you catch yourself where you're comparing your, oh, you had your hand up? You didn't? Oh, all right. Uh, the most important thing is like saying about I am loved today. I, I, I'm okay with myself. I love myself, and I and I, because I am able to love myself, I love others, and I stop uh, trying to kill myself. Yes. Huh? Uh, my arm, my chest, and my hip area. That's why I was in a the wheelchair. They uh, it fractured my hip, and then I was blessed. I have a bullet that comes through here and comes out of here. I don't know how I made it. Was a guy? He uh, he unloaded his gun. I don't know how I made it, but God. Like I said, God, God made it, it happen. Yeah, he got it made. Yes. But uh, thanks for allowing me to. Uh, God share. made it happen. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know too many people that get shot uh, seven times and survive. I, I do know. I do. I you know. I. I don't know. I don't know too many people get shot seven times. Listen. Okay, Hassani, come on back over here and sit down because I need you fr your eyes and your lips on me. Okay. Listen, before we go to break, so $25 here. No, it's not for you. It's for the program. Each of my speakers, you, did you say something? Okay. Each of my speakers donate a minimum of $50 a year. Their obligation is the $50 a year to wear these shirts and come talk to you. Did you hear me? So this is a partial payment. I get 50, I get 100, sometimes I get 200 just because they give it to us. Because they believe in the program that much, they have to give me a donation every single year of $50 to wear these t-shirts and take their own time out of their time off of work and come here and speak to you. Now you guys know when we when you usually invite people in to speak I'm talking, you know, the people are coming to these different organizations and they pay them to go talk. They pay us to come talk to you. They're actually donating to us to talk to you. So that's what is so important about this program. I want you guys to understand, okay? This is not about us. It is about you. And they don't have a problem donating. 
this is not going to help me keep this, this building alive and sustained. $50 is not going to help me keep this building up and running. Okay? It's the principle. What they give us and give you, you need to really take heed. And that's why I said that 10% is all I'm asking. But if you get 20 out of it, great. And plus you get fed for free. Plus you get a guest speaker that comes and gives you knowledge. And plus you get up to $150 a month if you choose to. Now, I don't know any program in the nation that does that. So give them a round of applause before we get to the next level. All right? I've known Mr. Ray since August 2012, and I met him on a home visit. I was a federal probation officer. I met him on a home visit, introduced my program. He shared with me all his juvenile stuff that he was putting together while he was in custody. That's how we met. And you know what's even crazier? His buddy... One of his boys, one of his best boys, he grew up in Wilmington. I grew up in Carson, California. My best friend found out seven years into my program, four years into my program. His buddy is my best friend's nephew. Yeah, that's crazy, right? I knew Petey when he was this tall, this tall, and they're best friends. Small world. They met in college, and not the one BYU or UNLV college. There you go. Federal universities where they met. All right? So what we're going to do right now, before we get to the closing guest speaker, we're going to get food, and when, what I want you to do is we're going to have all of you go first. Your children are first. We're going to have you go. Stay, don't move yet, okay? We're going to have you go through those doors, walk all the way around the other side of the building. Somebody should be there directing you. Maybe Jesse, Mr. Jesse, please. You're going to come through here, you're going to grab your food, and you're going to tell all of the workers, volunteers in there, thank you. Grab your food, come in here. We're going to do our affirmations. We're going to have a quick few announcements, and then I'm going to have Mr. Josh come and be the closing guest speaker for you, and then we'll do our graduations. We understand? All right, let's get you to stand up through those doors over there.
those
uh, tablet, and it was going to go. We put it in a, we put it in a raffle, and it was going to go to the person that had a 3.5 or better. Okay, I drew the ticket. There was only probably eight, eight to ten, and we drew it, and the winner was Sadie Harris. Sadie Harris, come on up. All right, congratulations. That's a really nice tablet. Come here, let's take a picture, young lady. This was given to us when I had my grand opening from my aunt. And, um, you know, we're going to try and continue to keep you guys engaged, right? And, and the problem is this. We want you to get more engaged. Here's the situation I'm going to share with you. Hold on, T. We have over 50, over 54% of people who've been through the system in our program. 54. Means some of you come, you know, from over the 10 years. 54% of you, some of you have been through the system. And you're in our program, or we're in our program. Here's the problem. We only have 12% out of 2,000 plus kids, 12% of you guys signing up for activities. That's a problem for me, and especially the kids who are from custody. So we have, the, we, have the, we have the opportunity for you guys to get involved in something to stay out of trouble. That's what we want to do, okay? Next month we'll have something else. We're not going to tell you what it is, but we're going to give certain prizes away to see who can get the next one, all right? Let's take a picture real quick. Are we good? Are we full? Congratulations. All right. Before we get to our guest speaker, I want to recognize Los Vaqueros and Mr. Andy. He had just left. He's with Los Vaqueros. Mr. Andy left. And Steve with Los Vaqueros. They donate $10,000 a year to this program to pay for the activities. They've given us over $70,000 since 2014. So he has an activity he wants to share with you guys. Thank you. So I know a lot of the money helps, right? Money helps. I'm going to give you an idea for a free activity. It's free for the kids. And the best part is it's free for Miss Sheree, too. Show of hands, anybody ever been in an airplane? Holy cow. All right, put your hands down. Anybody ever been in an airplane with a propeller in the front? Not a big jet, not with your mom and dad, with a propeller in the front. You thought about raising your hand. Was it half a propeller? No. <laughs> you were in one? A propeller? You know the old kind of plane where the thing spins around in the front and makes the plane go? Not a big jet, right? Not, not Southwest or Spirit or anything like that but a little airplane, where it's just you and the guy flying the plane. All right, show of hands. Anybody think they want to go in an airplane where it's just you and the guy flying the plane? And the guy might let you fly the plane. All right, so in a couple of weeks, it's the 20th of May. That's going to be a Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning at Henderson Airport, and you do have to sign up ahead of time. All right? This is put on by the Experimental Aircraft Association. Every airplane is inspected by the FAA. Every person flying is licensed by the FAA. And you will get a logbook, and you will be logging your first flight. So if you want to do that, it's free. All you have to do is sign up. We'll have somebody in the back that's got all the information. You must be between 7 and 17. So 7th birthday until the day before your 18th birthday. All right? I, I do want to come back to something, though, since, since you were kind enough to raise your hand. The theme tonight has kind of been one decision can change your life. For me, this was the decision. Somebody took me in an airplane, 
And I was so busy trying to get back in an airplane, I couldn't do drugs. <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have any time to get dr do drugs. I, I just, I got addicted to airplanes. So if you want to do it, talk to your parents. It is free. You need to get to the Henderson Airport. It's 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday the 20th, and we'll have the information for you. All right? Anything you can do that isn't getting in trouble is better than getting in trouble. Right? Any 10 years of learning to fly a plane or 10 years of learning to drive cool cars or 10 years of doing anything else is better than 10 years of sitting in a cell and thinking about what you could be doing if you weren't sitting in a cell. Right? I could be wrong. I never sat in a cell. <laughs> One day. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steve. Like I said, Los Vaqueros has been donating to us for the activity fund since 2014. You got something to say? Okay. Keep your mouth from moving. Okay? All right. Now, last thing. We're going to bring up Mr. Joss, but we're going to do our affirmations. If you are interested in what Mr. Steve just said about flying the airplanes or joining, stand up, Ms. Carmen, please. Look, guys, Ms. Carmen, if you are interested, make sure you come back and sign up before the end of the program with Ms. Carmen so we can get that information to you, okay? All right. All right. Last thing, May 20th as well. It's called the Grand Slam Family Jam at Doolittle. Anthem, that check over there that they gave us for 18000 for last year, I mean last month, Anthem Blue Cross Blue Shield, they're hosting this. It's all free, okay? Giveaways, free food, hot dogs, popsicles, contest games, face painting, bouncies, you name it. If you are interested, flyers are over there in the back of the room. Again, what's the date? May 20th, all right? Okay, let's stand up. Where's your cards that we gave you? Come up here, Hassani. You like running your mouth. I'm going to let you do something. Okay, listen. These affirmations are very powerful. And you should really consider saying them every day. Mr. Garfield had mentioned about not being loved. And some of you probably feel that way in here, right? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not a dummy. We take... We take we take those surveys every month of what you guys put on there as to what you feel. We want to know how you feel with your parents. So we listen. And we also take the parents' surveys and tell us how they feel about what you're doing too. So these are here, these are here to help you. That's why these books Mr. Gordon created. So when you get these books next month, I want you to express yourself in these books, and it's yours. It's not your parents. If you want to share with them, fine, but this is yours. All right? So you're going to repeat after Mr. Hassani, and you're going to repeat loud like you're outside on a team, talking to your boy or talking to your girl. We want to see your mouth moving, but we also want to hear you. Come on over, honey. You're going to read these. Come here. I don't bite. Sometimes. I matter. I, matter. I, love I love me. I am loved. I am talented. I am intelligent. I respect myself. I have dreams and goals. I have the power to overcome any abuse. I have the power to overcome abandonment. I can do whatever I set my mind to. I'm ready to make a positive change. I only fail when I stop trying. I believe these things to be true. And guess what? You don't have to repeat it. Guess what? So do we. That's why we created the program. I created this 2012 for you guys, not for me. And I grabbed a bunch of people who've been through the system. They're not throwaways. They're actually here now giving their life to you. So take heed of this conversations that we've had today, and then you're going to hear the closing speaker 
his story of how he didn't hit the system as an adult and has been very successful with his business. All right? Pick one of these real talk attitudes before you leave tonight and hone in on it. Focus on that. And every time you come back, take another one with you. All right? Take a seat. We're going to get to Mr. Josh. Do you have his um, bio? Yeah, you have, where's it at? It's all right here. Okay. All right. All right. So, Mr. Josh, you know, here's the interesting thing. I never met him. He, he sought us out. He sought us out because he wanted to give back. And I'm not going to steal his glory, but I read up on him, and uh, it's a pretty fascinating story. And you know what? In life, every one has a story. Everyone. I'm just going to tell you this. He has a very, 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 very successful real estate business and other things as well. He's not originally from here. But he ended up going to a place that you probably would never want to go, and I'm going to let him share how he got there as a juvenile. But he turned that around, and he's now giving back to his community. So, Mr. Josh, come on up. He has a passion for at-risk kids, teenagers, so I'm going to let him share his story. He has a very lengthy autobiography or biography, but I understand it but I'm not going to read it to you. I'm going to let him know or let, let him share his story. Single family home. I'm going to let him share it. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Yeah. What is it? Good evening. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> so I'll have a little bit of nerves, but they'll get out of my system shortly and then I'll start rolling. But you all have an incredible story, incredible story. Um, and thank you for taking the time to share it. So my name is Josh Galindo. I am born and raised in Las Vegas. Uh, I think Sharif. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, I'm born and raised in Las Vegas. Um, I think I'm going to start with telling you guys my story. So let's see. Born and raised in Las Vegas. I grew up understanding that my my biological father had an abusive relationship with my mom and he in a nutshell chose drugs over me so I only I never met my dad ever um, I I understood my dad as uh, someone that was abusing my mother and uh, my mom had to um, grab my sister and I and leave him. So that's kind of where my memory starts of my childhood. So I grew up out on a road called Lone Mountain, which to you guys is probably in the middle of town now. But when I grew up out there, it was in the middle of nowhere. We were the only house. And thankfully, one of my neighbors had horses, and I gravitated to that gentleman and all four of his horses and 12 cattle. And I would often hang out over there, and he would teach me how to clean the horse corrals, pick up poop, uh, feed the horses, give them hay. And uh, it was a great life. I lived out there because that was all my mom could afford. You and I are not going to play this game. No, no, I watched you play it back there, and you and I are not going to play this game. Thank you. Thank you. I just thought I'd set that tone real quick. Um, so I grew up out there and then we had to move. We moved into the city. Life was still relatively good. And the reason it was good is because I don't think I understood how my brain worked or I had a lot of comparison. So I started going to school and I started seeing other children hanging out with their dads. And then of course, what would I do? I would naturally compare myself to them. And I was like, I don't have a dad. Where's my dad? Why isn't my dad or my mom able to drop me off at school and then pick me up? Why am I going to safe key in the morning and at night? So I immediately started building self-limiting beliefs about myself. So I started to 
I want to make sure you guys understand what self-limiting beliefs are. I started to identify myself as different than all of the other kids. And then as I continued through my life, I'm at soccer practice. And there's a dad with his kid. And my mom is with me. And I'm like, why isn't my dad here? Was I not good enough to have my dad be present in my life? So at whatever point I had that thought, that was the moment that I told myself I wasn't worthy of love, I wasn't worthy of my father's approval, acceptance, and attention, and that he made a conscious choice to leave me. And with that belief system, I began to act out. I was looking for ways to get attention, get approval from all of my friends. And one of the easy ways to do that is to find a shitty crowd. Sorry. Yes, that's okay. Find a shitty crowd to hang out with and get my attention, approval, and acceptance from them. So obviously we were getting into a lot of trouble doing mischief, mischievous things, because I'm still young. When you're young, you're doing mischievous things, which was like kind of in trouble, kind of bad things. And then I continued to do all of those things, and my mom saw that that was probably not a great neighborhood for us to live in. So she moved again. Now I'm a little bit older. Let's call this uh, 10, 11, 12, 13. So one day after school, I'm hanging out in the school, and uh, I walk into the construction site. And I find these little bullet-sized things that go into a nail gun. You ever hear this sound? It sounds like this. On a construction site. Okay, that's a little bullet inside of that gun. And they use that bullet to push a nail into concrete. So I picked that up, and I took it home, and being a mischievous, curious little boy, I set it on my uh, uh, garage floor, and I hit it with a hammer. Thank you. I love, what's your name? That was a killer reaction. Ariana? I hit it with a hammer. It ricocheted off that concrete and shot through my left eyelid into my eyeball. I blinked. My eyelid stuck there. I blinked, and with my good eye, I saw blood shoot out of my left eye. And at that point, I knew something bad had happened. So I got up. Mom wasn't home because she had to work. And the reason she had to work is because she didn't have a dual income. Dad wasn't there, and she was raising my sister and I. So I was doing lots of dumb things I shouldn't have been doing because I wasn't being supervised. And I wasn't taking advantage of after-school activities like you guys are being encouraged to do. I had time. And what did I do with my time? I hit bullets with hammers, and then it shot off the concrete and shot into my eye. I run across the street and uh, bang on my neighbor's door. He opens the door. Of course, I'm sure he's shocked. He sees a kid with blood dripping down his face. I run into his house, throwing water on it, and all I could see with my good eye is blood going all over the dishes. I remember thinking, holy shit, I really, I really messed up. I go into his bathroom. This, I'm like running around his house. I go into his bathroom. And I remember holding my eyelid open and looking at it with my good eye, and it was, my eyeball was destroyed. So I get into an ambulance, and I go to the hospital. I'm going to fast forward through this. I go through four surgeries later, and they're able to save my eyeball. But there, every single doctor walked in and said I was going to lose my eye. And one nurse, so much so that they were getting ready to... We were talking to doctors to make me a fake eye and match my eye color and all the other stuff because they were so sure I was going to lose my eye that they were going to plan a surgery to remove my good eye and replace it with a fake eye. And a nurse walks in and she says, you know, there's a kid down the hall. Nobody, my mom was gone. Nobody was there. It was me and this nurse. There's a kid down the hall that was playing swords with... Uh, wrapping paper tubes you know like a toilet paper tube and then you have like a paper towel tube and then the wrapping paper tube so they put knives on the end of these wrapping paper tools and we're playing swords and this little boy got stabbed in his eye with a knife and she looked at me and she said and he's going to keep his eye they were able to to fix it and in that moment 
was when I learned the power of manifestation and the power of how powerful each and every one of your minds are and obviously how powerful my mind was. And while every doctor walked in and told me I was going to lose my eye, I just started telling myself, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my eye. I'm going to keep my eye. I'm going to keep my eye. I swear to God, I was like so committed to the story. I'm going to keep my eyeball. And sure enough, my body told my eyeball to start healing itself. It may sound crazy, but this is a real eye. And long story short, I was able to keep my eye. But the consequence of that decision, back to the kind of the context of this whole speaking event here, is one decision changes everything in our lives. That decision to take that thing home, hit it with a hammer, have it go into my eyeball, take me out of school for a year, four eye surgeries later, it put me behind in school. So now I'm in school and I can't keep up. I can't do the math. I can't do the English. I can't do any of the stuff that, that they're teaching me. Well, what did that do? Created another self-limiting belief. And what was that self-limiting belief? It was that I was stupid. Since you were not bothering everybody else, I will take your question. What is it, Jonathan? What stopped my life was stopped my education? That, that's a, that is a big part of it. There, I have a lot of these little moments. I'm just getting into the juicy stuff. I had to, I had to get you guys there, though, first. All right, so I, was, uh, I create a self-limiting belief in myself, which all of us have self-limiting beliefs. And when you guys understand what your self-limiting beliefs are, you can actually counter them. Meaning if you think you're stupid, you can change that belief about yourself by simply saying, I am smart. So I create a self-limiting, but I didn't understand this at the time. So I create a self-limiting belief that I was stupid, okay? Well, when you create a self-limiting belief about yourself, you do things to reinforce that belief. So you say to yourself, I am stupid. Well, now you're going to go and do things to reconfirm that you're stupid. So now I'm way behind in school. So now I start getting into mis real bad activities. I start hanging out with gang members. I start hanging out with people that are using, abusing alcohol, drugs, sex, all the bad things that a kid my age should not have been doing. And I start getting into trouble. Long story short, because I don't want to glamorize it, I get arrested and I go to juvie. Now, I, get out of, I go to juvie and I realize I'd really messed up. But now I create another self-limiting belief about myself. I'm a bad kid. I'm a bad person. So what do you do when you create a self-limiting belief about yourself? You reconfirm that belief. So now I did more bad things to reconfirm that belief that I had about myself. So I, I go home. I get out of jail. My mom bailed me out. I had a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. I felt terrible that I put my mom through that. Now, of course, I did not express my emotions. So what did I do? I bottled them all up. I held it in. So then I'm starting to want to run away from my mom because I could see the pain in her eyes when I looked at her, the pain that I had created. And what did that do? That created pain within me. Well, none of us like pain, right? So we avoid pain. So I would run away. So I ran away, I ran away, I ran away. And now as a parent, I can tell each and every one of you that your parents are tormented when they don't know where you're at. And when they don't know if you're safe, they don't know if you're, if you're alive, they don't know that stuff. So trust me, if you think they don't care, they do. So I come home, and from, being, from running, running away for a brief moment, a brief moment, like six days, and uh, I go to sleep. And I'm woken up by two men holding my arms like this at 3 in the morning with, like, a Hercules-level grip. And I look, and I look. It's 3 in the morning, and I'm panicked. I think I'm being kidnapped. Well, I was. I was being kidnapped out of my bed by two escorts. And I was taken to, I was, I was, I was told to get up, get dressed, and... 
you're going to a school in Mexico. And I'm like, Mexico? But again, you got to remember, I'm three. Er, I'm three. I'm 16. It's 3 a.m. And, uh, and, um, and obviously, I don't know much about the world. Anyway, they put me in knee braces. Knee braces that start from your ankle and go to the top of your thigh. Because they knew that I could run quick. Who here is really fast? Raise it strong. Raise it confident. That a boy. Um, they knew I was fast, so they put me in knee braces. And I walked to the car like this. And then they put me in the car, and they waddled me in, and then shut the door. And they threw me a pack of cigarettes. And they knew if I had smoked myself stupid, that if I did try to run, I'd run for about 10 feet and be winded and wouldn't be able to run anymore. I get to McCarran Airport. I waddle through the airport. They put me on an airplane. They put me on the window seat. They sit next to me, and they fly me to San Diego. They land in San Diego. I get off. I think at that point they took the knee braces off, but I don't remember. They drove me right into Mexico, and they drive me up to this facility that has 18-foot walls. It was a lockdown facility. Now, there was a lot of talk about what these folks have been through in the, the system or jail, or, and I can't speak on it, so forgive me if I miss misspeak, but prison, jail, and, and I would argue, obviously both have their pros and cons, I wouldn't want to compare myself to prison at all, that my space was every bit as structured as or more than jail. Let me give you a few examples. When I got there, I immediately said, can I go to the bathroom? Because I didn't know what I was up against. And uh, I go to the bath, I say, can I go to the bathroom? So they get on the radio and they go, in Spanish, this kid wants to go to the bathroom. So I have to wait for a guy to come grab me. Guy grabs me, walks me through these doors, has a set of keys that you can hear the guy coming from a mile away. They're so big. Unlocks this door. Now, of course, I'm thinking, I'm just going to the bathroom. Why is this guy unlocking a door to go to the bathroom? So I walk into this facility, and I see just lines of kids everywhere. That's when I knew I would really messed up. Yeah. It was silent. There was no noise. Lines. And what was even crazier about the lines is I'd walk by, and all of us like we're doing now are naturally looking at their surroundings. Not one person looked at a line. Their hands were at their sides. They were, they were structured. So now I go to the bathroom. Kid walks into the bathroom, me trying to figure out where I'm at. I look at the kid next to me. I'm like, what is this place? The kid refused to look at me. He wouldn't respond. Now I'm thinking I'm in like the twilight zone. I'm like, this is some creepy, creepy stuff. So they start to enroll me into the system. They take me up to the third floor because if I'm on the third floor and I act up, I got to make it down two and then down to the first floor before I can get away. It gives them time to catch me. Takes me to the third floor. Third floor. It's called Tracer Tracer Pise. I don't remember how to say it anymore. Third, how do you say third floor in Spanish? Tracer Piso? Yeah. Third floor. Thanks, guys. Tres? There you go, buddy. So they take me to the third floor, and they, st and they sit me in a chair, and they shave my head, put me in a uniform, and then tell me I'm going to be there for a minimum of 16 months. 16 months at 16 years old. That's like a lifetime. Okay? I start to freak out. No way I'm going to be here for 16 months. My parents and my mom did not send me here knowing I'd be here for 16 months. And I start yelling at him, trying to be tough, trying to, you know, intimidate him, get him to buckle, to get my mom on the radio, to get my mom on the phone, to get me sent back to Las Vegas out of Mexico. I'm in a separate country. So I'm starting to really lash out. They get on the radio, they go, Codio Rojo, which means code red in Spanish. This dude named Arturo comes through the door. He basically hits his head walking through the door. He's so big. Picks me up by the back of my neck and the back of my pants and slams me down on the ground, grabs the back of my head, slams my chin down, makes sure that I'm in this position on my belly with my chin on the ground. And he sat on me until I calmed down. The worst part is I had to stay in that position. And if I got out of the position, then he would sit on me again. I immediately knew I had messed up. Okay? So I was in that facility for 16 months, and the only way that I could get out was with good behavior. It wasn't time. 
Time meant nothing. It was you either change or you stay here till you're 18. So I stayed there until, so I worked the system because I had sobered up real quick. And it was 17 and a half is when I got, I got out. And I went home and I learned so much about myself in that facility, of which I'm going to talk about after my story. Um, I went home and uh, I had learned how I operate. I learned how my mind worked. I had learned why I was acting the way that I was acting so that I could change it. Because a lot of the problem is, is that we don't know why we're doing the things that we're doing. Why do I always get in trouble? Why am I always the one being picked on? Why do I always get into a fight? Like, always think. Think about after you react negatively in your life, whether that be you got into a fight, you yelled at your parents, you got sent to the principal's office, whatever it is. I guarantee you at some point when all of the emotion calms down, you ask yourself, why did I do that? Give me a head shake if that's what happens. Right? Okay. If you guys can learn why you did that, then you could learn how not to do it. And that's what this school taught me. So I get home, and I'm like, I'm going to go to work. Or, or no, I go, I'm going to finish school at home. I get in trouble in school one last time. And at that moment, I knew the rest of my life, I was only going to live and operate from a space of what's called integrity, which means doing the right thing even if nobody is looking. Because I didn't want to deal with all the shame, guilt that comes with doing the wrong thing and getting caught for it. So I jumped into the workforce and I started working. Why? Because I loved money. Who here loves money? Do you guys know why you love money? Anybody want to give me an answer? I'll take that. Go ahead, hit big shot. Okay, good. Stay with me. You like to buy the things you want. Why? It's probably because it makes them feel good. Anybody agree with that? Right? You get the things you want, makes you feel good. I liked money because it gave me, because it gave me freedom. Who wants to be controlled here? Raise your hand if you like being controlled. <laughs> Sorry. You knew where I was going, though. You knew where I was headed. Okay? Nobody really likes to be controlled. But money is a ticket that allows you to control your own destiny. It allows you to buy what you want when you want to. It allows you to go the places that you want to go when you want to go. It allows you to take care of people around you that may need help. Unfortunately, that's the way our society is built. And all we can really do at this point is embrace it and figure out how to play the game that society has put together for us to play. And the problem is a lot of us here, you, you folks, and me back in the day, refused to play by those rules. And all it did was kept getting me a penalty, getting me a, a flag, you know, a football flag. But finally, when I embraced it, I was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to embrace the rules of, this, of society, and I'm going to learn to manipulate them. I'm going to learn to use them strategically. I'm going to learn to use them to make me money. And I basically got into the real estate business, and I started flipping homes. Does anybody know what flipping homes means? You buy a house that's really ugly and ugly and ugly and ugly. You put a bunch of money into it. You make it pretty, and then you sell it, and you make a profit. Now, I've done that a thousand times. That means I've flipped. I've bought, fixed up, and sold a thousand homes. Actually, over a thousand at this point. Thank you. <laughs> I do, my best year I ever did, I did 123 homes in one year. The second best year I ever did was 118 homes, and the third best year was 111, okay? So I decided I'm going to take all this energy that I have, all of this desire to go against the grain, all of this pain that I had created for myself, unfortunately, in my life and endured growing up without a dad, believing I'm stupid, believing I'm not good enough, believing I'm not worthy, I'm going to take all that pain and I'm going to use it to motivate me to go make money so that I can do what I want to do when I want to do it. So I flipped over a thousand homes. I've built a brokerage, which is basically a real estate company. I won't get into the details. That has a, a hundred agents that, that, that hang their license with me. And then I got into a space which is called rental properties. Rental properties 
Are we still there? Are we losing it? You're all right. Rental properties create real wealth. Stay with me. Real wealth. Okay? And I went and bought 79 of those. And then I was like, you know what? Life's really good right now. I've always wanted to own a Lamborghini. So I said, I'm going to go buy a Lamborghini, and I went and bought a Lamborghini. Then I was like, you know what would be really cool? Is to have a G-Wagon. Anybody know what a G-Wagon is? Okay. I have what's called a G-Wagon squared. A G-Wagon squared is basically a G-Wagon on steroids. So I said, I'm going to go buy a G-Wagon squared. And then I was like, you know what would be cool is to have a vacation home. I'm going to go buy a vacation home. I'll tell you this quick story. So I bought a little tiny vacation home, and then I outgrew it. I was like, you know what? I'll go buy a bigger one. So I went and bought a second one and outgrew that. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to do this again, so I'm going to go buy the biggest vacation home that I know I'll never outgrow. And I went and bought a 5,500-square-foot, five-car garage on a half acre in Brian Head. Does anybody know what Brian Head is? Brian Head's a ski resort in Utah. The only reason I'm telling you guys this is that if you stay on the path that you're on, you won't have the opportunity or luxury to eventually one day say, I can do whatever I want. You're going to have the complete opposite. You're going to have somebody to, I believe it was your point, yep, Mr. Garfield. You're going to have somebody telling you what to wear, how to wear it, what time to eat, what time to go to bed, what time to wake up, what time to shower, how to breathe, how to look. If you stay on the path that you're on. So who would want to take the better path? Raise your hand if you prefer the better path. Come on. What's your name, Romel? What's up, buddy? I'm Josh. Good to meet you, brother. I see you paying attention. I appreciate it. Um, good. So let's figure out how to get there. There's a few things that I want to touch on that I think I'd like to leave you guys with as far as tools go. First and foremost, all of that pain, who here has experienced pain and trauma? I think we all have, really. Okay, but thanks for raising your hand. Pain is what's driving these bad decisions because bad decisions bring short-term pleasure, and that short-term pleasure provides temporary relief from that pain. That's why we go do bad things, because it feels good for a moment, which makes us forget about the pain we're experiencing. But unfortunately, it's only momentarily. And then, unfortunately, again, you have to do it again to relieve the pain, because it's only short term. So how do you guys relieve the pain? Because it's pain that's driving bad decisions. I promise. How do you relieve that? You guys, think about emotions and feelings like a big, huge ball of yarn. Okay? Get that visual. I'm sure a lot of you guys are visual thinkers. I know that I was a visual thinker, and I think for whatever reason, troubled teens or youth think in pictures, and that's me. So picture this big, huge ball of yarn, and it's up in your head, and it's just spinning around and spinning around and spinning around, and try to find the end of it. It's very difficult to do, right? Well, that, all that pressure of that yarn growing every time that someone tells you you're stupid, you're unintelligent, you're not loved, you're not worthy, your mom or your dad aren't in your life the way that you would hope that they would be, and then the belief that you think about yourself because of that, you add another layer to that yarn ball. And then as you get older, you made another bad decision, you hurt somebody, and you looked at them, and you saw the pain, and then you felt guilt and shame for causing pain, add another layer of yarn on that yarn ball. Eventually that yarn ball gets so big that it creates mental health disorders, creates depression, creates bad thoughts. You begin to start to say, I just want to get rid of this pain. And that's why a lot of people will resort to, result, resort to suicide because they can't get rid of the pain. Well, let's talk about how to get rid of the pain. It's using your mouth. So let's imagine for a second that we caught the end of that yarn ball. And every word that you either communicate using your mouth 
or write down, aka journaling, or for you young, young lads probably have phones or some kind of tablet, or that you type out, you're pulling that yarn out. And you're pulling it out. And you're pulling it out. Keep visualizing this with me. And that yarn ball is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why expressing your emotions and your feelings is so important. It's not about crying and being a, 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 a softy because you're talking about your emotions. You're actually improving your mental health by doing it. That's the big thing that I want you guys to leave with because I can overload you with a bunch of tools and you probably won't remember all of them. So I'm going to double down on that. Using your mouth to communicate your emotions, whether it's to a friend, to a neighbor, to, a, a fish, uh, to an authority figure at your school, these lovely folks that are here to support you, this whole building that's here to support you, you guys have to learn to pull that yarn out so that yarn ball gets smaller. Yep, and then what's going to happen is life's going to throw more yarn on it. It's going to get big again, and then you get back and you just, you, you just visualize this. Never forget. All right? Okay, so I'm not done. We're going to do a little bit of a Q&A. Anybody got any questions for me? <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Come on, sincerely, guys. What's up? What do you got? I will come to you, okay, but I promise. But serious questions. Let's try to make this something that's beneficial and helpful so that you guys can leave here and go, dude, that guy, he touched me. Okay, not, not fun and games, okay? But go ahead. What do you got, Jonathan? Loud, like confidently. He kidnapped me too? Okay. Is there still like a facility? It's not out there anymore. My, the one in Mexico is not out there anymore. But basically, that facility, my mom had to sign off 49% of her parental rights. And the only reason that it was 49 and they got 51 is so that, excuse me, 51 per, no, 40, yeah, 51% is what she signed off on. And that 1% was the difference between getting me back if she wanted to pull me back. But basically, she said, you guys raised my kid. So... Come on, hit me with something else. What do you got in the back? Congratulations and good job on having the confidence and the bravery of asking a question. What's your name? David. Hit me. Great question, David. Thank you for asking that. Do I think college is worth it? It depends on if you're going to be an entrepreneur. Who knows what an entrepreneur is? Raise your hand. Okay. An entrepreneur is somebody that creates their own business, and they think that they have no boss, but trust me, when you create your own business, you go from having one boss to like 50, which are your clients. And then you've got like another 10, which are your team members or employees. But do I think college is absolutely necessary? I don't. If you're on the right path, if you need more structure when you turn 18, because you're still kind of a wild animal that's just not quite been tamed yet, then yeah, go to college because it's a structured environment. And it's not going to hurt you because at the very worst, you graduate and you've accomplished something. And every time you accomplish something, you create more confidence. And the only way to, to navigate this very difficult world that we all live in, this challenging, difficult world that we all live in, is with confidence. So if you're going to be a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer, then college is probably absolutely important. If you're going to go be an entrepreneur, pursue your passion, pursue your goal, something that emotionally charges you, that can make money, then I would personally, I would tell you to go and pursue that first. Great question. Uh, I'm going to take Madison, and then I'll take you. Okay, bud? Go ahead, Madison. Oh, it was a dumb story. <laughs> I stole a golf cart. <laughs> I didn't steal just a golf cart. So here's the thing. I got arrested because I had too much time on my hands and I was making poor decisions, and I was operating out, uh, and I was making decisions because I wanted approval. There was this, you know those little dumb orange or yellow golf carts at your schools that like the janitor drives around on with, gar with, with garbage cans on the back? One of my friends, I drove my car to this school with my friend, and we climbed over the wall, as crazy as that is, and he's like, we should steal that. And I didn't really know this guy, but I wanted his approval. I wanted to make him like me. So 
I was like, okay. And I did. And even dumber, I spray painted my name on it. And so when, <laughs> when they found it, I'm like, it wasn't me. <laughs> They're like, it says Josh Galindo on it. So I went to jail for Grand Theft Auto because it was $2,000. It was over $2,000. And, uh, yeah, it was an embarrassing moment. That's why I said, let's just skip that part. All right, good. You guys are loosening up. Let's, let's add some value. I said you'd go next. So what do you got, bud? You want me to tell you what that is? That's called the pupil. The pupil is the black spot in your eye. Now, your eyeball is compressed, believe it or not, like a balloon. If you were to pop a balloon in slow motion, you don't see it because it happens so quick. But all that air comes out of that hole that you popped. So the same thing with your eyeball. When that, that object shot through my eyeball, all of the liquid and fluid inside of my eye shot out that hole. So the body being a miraculous, incredible thing, so we should all value our bodies, my pupil shot down to block the hole. Well, the pupil goes big and small, right? It's a muscle. It moves. Well, I pulled that muscle permanently, and that's why it stays down. So good observation, though. What do you got? I did. I played soccer. I, play, I did track, and then I did football. Sports is everything, guys. Get involved. When I'm listening to Ms. Cherie over here tell me how incredible this program is, I wish I had this program. I had to get taken to Mexico and lose 100% of my freedoms to get made right and then released back into society. You guys get to go home and go on TikTok and Instagram and watch TV and, you know, lay in a comfortable bed alone. You know, I, I was in a room with eight other men. And at night, there was a guy that sat right here and watched us sleep to make sure that we didn't do anything crazy. That means I couldn't get out of, if, if I had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, I had to say, disculpa me, which was, excuse me, can I use the restroom? Like, I didn't get to just go. And if there was a kid already in the bathroom, I had to wait. So now imagine having to wait to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Try going back to sleep after that. You're like, I've been up now for 10 minutes. I don't have to go to bed. I don't have to go back to sleep. Okay, um, you asked about sports. Take advantage of this opportunity. Take advantage of this opportunity. It's an unbelievable program, and I'm still new to it. I'm sure it's got lots more things that I don't even know about. Okay, I'm, and I got a list that I'm going to go through before I'm done here, but keep going. Or Go ahead, young lady. Absolutely. Yeah, he uh, physically assaulted her. Again, I wasn't there. That's why I kind of explained it the way that I did. I can only use my memory and of stories to visualize what I probably was experiencing because my dad left when I was one. So I had no dad, zero dad. He didn't come back. He didn't send a birthday card. He didn't show up on the weekends. Like, mom, zero dad. So, yeah, she was physically assaulted. Okay, let's go through some of these things. And if you guys have a question, I did say I'd take your question, so go ahead. So you said that you used to uh, learn how to um, uh, pick up horse poop. All right, let's keep moving. So the most powerful tool I can leave you with today is the ability to say no. Is the ability to say no, guys. Listen, 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 focus. This is strong, okay? Your friends are going to say, let's climb over the wall at school and steal a golf cart. If I would have said no... I wouldn't have had to go through the Mexico story, okay? Um, if your friends are like, hey, you want to try this? Just say no. You don't have to explain it. You don't have to justify it. Just say no. And here's what's going to happen. A lot of the times you're not going to want to say no because you're going to want the approval and the acceptance and the attention of the person you're saying no to. And you're going to be afraid that if you say no, you're going to lose that. But based on everybody up here's story, it was one no away from changing their entire life. You don't have to explain anything to anybody. Just no. I'm out. And you guys can, like, script some stuff in the mirror. I'm good. I'm out, dog. I'm all right. You know, whatever you guys use at this age, you know, some slang. You know, but, like, I'm cool. I'm all right. You know, you don't just be like, no. You know, but practice that. Practice saying no, okay? All right, let's go to another thing. Bad things 
are not cool. Just learn that now. I don't think I have to go into deep detail there. Doing bad things doesn't make you cool. It's not cool. It's what, what you're doing is you're trying to distract yourself from the pain that you're experiencing. If you're experiencing pain, then go back to the yarn conversation. That means that it's time to sit down and journal. It means it's time to call the counselor at school. It means it's time to call the neighbor and talk to them. Get that pain out of your mind. Who you hang out with absolutely matters. Absolutely matters. Whoever you're hanging out with, if this guy's making bad decisions and that guy's making bad decisions, you can guarantee you will be making bad decisions. All right, let's see, let's see. And that's pretty much uh, what I got here. Okay, help, what else can I do to help you guys? Give me, some, give me another question. Come on, you're going to walk away and you're going to say, I wish I would have asked that question. Hit me. What's that? Say it again. It, it never, it, well, I think I'm understanding your question. My eyeball did shrink because all the fluid in it shot out. So they had to sew it closed and then repump it full of fluid. But I wasn't awake to see that. So no, I didn't get to see it regrow. I didn't lose my old eye. I just was able to save my current eye, if that makes sense. But I appreciate you asking the question. Hit me. What do you got? You guys love my eye story. <laughs> That's okay. I'm, we're good. Oh, no, I can't see out of my left side. One decision away from knowing that if I ever lost my right eye's vision, I wouldn't be able to watch my kids play soccer. One decision you guys could all close your eyes, and that's how I'd walk through the rest of my life. One decision. One decision. That's how important one decision is. What's your name? Kaylin? Hi, Kaylin. What made me get into real estate? Well, here's the thing. Is we all have a st okay, what made me get into real estate is I wanted to be able to dictate my future. I knew that this is something to take away with. Take away from this. Commission. Commission-based jobs, sky's the limit. You'll be able to make as much money as you possibly can or want. There is no cap, okay? And versus exchanging time for money. So you could go, hey, even if you say, I w I'm getting paid $100 an hour, how many hours can your body physically work in a day? And whatever that number is, you're capped. So to me, I wanted unlimited, unlimited earning potential is what it's called, and I got into real estate. What do you got in the back? What made me do flipping houses? Well, again, I'm kind of a control freak, um, which I don't think's bad. It's just go, it's about how you go about it. Could be bad. But I enjoy having control over my life. And when I have a bunch of clients fighting over the color of a chandelier, nearly killing my source of income, um, I didn't want that stress in my life. And when I owned the house and fixed up the house, I eliminated half of the drama, basically. It's probably a complicated question, but I wanted to be in control of my destiny. That was why. Great question. Thank you for asking. What do you got? Yeah, it's hard to flip the houses. But you know what's, what's great is everything that you guys do that's hard in your life, when you're done with it, you'll feel better about yourself. If you keep doing easy things, there's no reward. You have to do hard things. We crave challenge as human beings. Think about the building we're standing in. Like, we weren't living like this when we were cavemen. We're naturally designed in our DNA to embrace and seek challenge. Someone was like, I want to build a, a cave. I want to build a better cave. And then it was a house. And then it was a building. And now there are these buildings. So anytime you guys are challenged, take it as a good thing. Embrace it. Okay? Okay. Please. I do. Yeah, and, I, and I'm, I, I love teaching people, and I'd love to interact with you and see if there's a fit there. I, I love seeing people take this wild world that we live in and make it work in your favor. As long as you're fighting the stream, it, it's going to be a very tiring, difficult battle. So you might as well figure out how to do it an easier way. Please. 
So I had to go get licensed by the state of Nevada, which is becoming a Nevada real estate licensee is technically the term. And then I had to go and become what's called a realtor. You guys may have heard of that term. And then that allows me to be a part of an association that primarily focuses on residential real estate. So, but house flipping is a, a great business. You know why it's a great business? Is there's always somebody destroying a house. A uh, young man in the back with the, the black shirt on. My favorite part of real estate is it allows me to spend extra time with my family. That was my nine-year-old boy that asked that question. <laughs> Go, ahead. Go ahead, bud. And then, as she said, one more question after you, and then we're done. Go ahead. That's correct. That's correct. I cannot see from my left eye. So you are gone. Bye. Now you're back. <laughs> Yeah, wouldn't you rather still have your eye? You want a fake eye? What if it gets stuck? What if it falls out if you sneeze? You know what I'm saying? What? Uh, you, you gotta ask, I gotta take this one. Oh, wait, yeah, all right. Go ahead. Listen, I just, I wanna answer your questions. I just want them to be of value. Go ahead. Great question. My first car was a Jeep Grand Cherokee. Um, and then my second car was a Mitsubishi Eclipse. Um, but I love cars, I'm a car guy. Let me just end it with this. Listen, I told you guys where I started, where I got jammed up, where I started creating self-limiting beliefs about myself. I could tell you at the lowest point of my life, I never thought that I'd be standing here able to rattle off the accomplishments that I have. I never, ever believed it, ever. And a lot of you may be sitting in that position right now. You may never believe you'll own a home. You may never believe you'll have a successful career. You may never believe you'll have a, a whole family with children that look up to you. You may never think that. But now's the time that you guys can switch that thinking and you can have all those things. I swear to God. Why? Because we are made up of the exact same things. I have skin, I have bones, and I have blood. The only difference that makes me able to do what I do is my brain. And all of you have a brain too. So it's how you program it. Okay? Start programming it now. You're young. Okay, I wish you guys unbelievable, unconditional success and happiness, and uh, thank you for your time. And if anybody doesn't know, I can't see out of my left eye, just in case anybody didn't know that. Just kidding. Well, like I said, you know, Mr. Josh sought us out, so God is good, right? God is good. Before she does that, because I see something there. I actually forgot to give her this. Here's 100 bucks for letting me speak. This is my commitment. I am paying them to let me speak. That's, I'm here selflessly. So there you go. So at any rate, you know, we, we are excited for him to be here, Mr. Josh. Um, you know, a lot of his accolades he shared with you guys and the struggles that he went through as a child. Listen, as I said to you before, everyone has a story. Okay, you are in control of your own canvas painting. You can, make your, you can make your life anything you want. Paint a picture for yourself. And you be the one coming here, giving your testimony as a person who's never tapped into the system. We would love you on this side. But we'll also use you over here, too. But we don't want that. I mean, that's just real talk. You, you go the wrong route, we want you over here. So paint your picture the way you see it. You have your own canvas. You need to take heed on both sides. You learned here and you learned here. And his struggle is not your struggle, not their struggle. Everybody has their own struggle in life. What God has for you is for you and no one can take it away. No one. Stay the course. Do what you're supposed to do. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. As a, as a token of our appreciation for you to come out, we give a T-shirt all the time to our speakers. Look at that. Also, a little gift for you here. So we thank you so much. Stick around. We're going to have graduation. We want you to be a part of the picture. Thank you, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank you. So, so we're going to step right into our, our um, graduates, okay? We have, I believe, seven Tonight, if we can get those graduate certificates, thank you again, Mr. Josh. Before we bring those certificates up or whomever is bringing them up, please, um, 
Listen, you guys are all here, and you saw Mr. Lyle's M uh, MMA, not MMA, uh, Muay Thai boxing, right? Everybody saw that? Listen, there are flyers in the back of the room. If you are interested, grab one. If you are interested or sign up for anything else, Miss Carmen, all of the new folks who met Miss Carmen over on the other side, she is right here. If you have that sheet of paper filled out, please give it to Miss Carmen at the end of the night because if I do not get that sheet, I don't know you want to sign up for anything. So if I don't have it in my hands by tonight, then I don't know how to re I don't know why I should reach out to you. That's the only way we know you your child wants to get funded. So fill it out, the request for activity sheet. I will then send you that email. If you do not respond to the email, I don't go chasing people to give money away. That's 